any podcast that we do with Luke Coutinho happens to be one of the most loved pieces on this channel. This one is about the story behind the brand Luke Coutinho, what it took. Keep in mind, he began creating this brand that we know of at age 34. Before that, he worked in the corporate space. He even worked as a DJ in Goa. This is the story of his journey from growing up in Goa till setting up this internationally famous brand that we know that's called Luke Coutinho. Luke is a huge mentor to me. He's guided me in some of the most painful moments of my life. There's some emotional parts of this episode. I actually shed a tear for the first time in this one. It's one of the episodes that's the closest to my heart because I've known Luke for a very long time. Luke has guided me out of some of the darkest moments of my life. And strangely enough, this episode was recorded on a very important day for my career. So I've become an investor on Ready, Set, Jet. It's the first company that I've invested in myself. We've come very far in this YouTube game thanks to all the support from you guys, from being a YouTuber to an entrepreneur to now an investor. It's just very overwhelming for me. If you want to check out Ready, Set, Jet products, of course, they're linked down below. Some amazing cosmetics and skincare products. I really feel you'll enjoy it. Try it out at least. But for now, enjoy. One of my favorite human beings ever in the world. Luke Coutinho, he's on The Ranbir Show. Luke Coutinho, I call you one of the all-stars of this show. Uh, your episodes are always the most loved. Uh, a lot of people know about your knowledge. This one's a little more about the story. I know that your story is going to contain a lot of knowledge as well. So firstly, welcome back to the Ranveer show. It's good to see you, bro. Good to see you. So uh, I think, you know, before mm. we started this show, we used to have this little inspiring interview series. And you were one of my first picks for that. And you explained how you went from being a DJ to um, starting your own brand, which we all know now online. Uh, but this one's a little more about like the business side of things also. How did you traverse that world? Uh, let's let's talk about that whole story. But <laughs> as of now, in 2021, life has brought you back to Goa, the place where all of it started. Yeah. Uh, so what's what's that been like? What, how's your lockdown been? What's the last year been like for you? My lockdown's been amazing. No disrespect to the people who have suffered through it. Mm. You know, I mean, at any point in life, if someone's feeling good and doing good, there's someone on the other side suffering. Mm. So I'm not going to be all saintly and say that, you know, <laughs> oh, you know, it's been bad right through. Yeah. It's been great. It's been great. You know, we've worked with patients who have now recovered through COVID. We've seen patients. There's a lot of learning around here. The amount that we've learned through COVID, like if COVID didn't happen, it shouldn't have happened. And it's not as drastic as we think it is. Mm. Do you know the amount of people who are dying of starvation? The numbers are more than the, the amount of lives lost during COVID. Yeah. Diabetics, 3 million deaths a year. We've not even done 0.001% of that. Exactly. Cancer deaths, cardiovascular heart attacks. It's huge. Mm. So, you know, when the media shows us these numbers, it instills fear in us. But when you, exactly. when you seg segment it and break it down, the numbers are not as bad. I wish no one died from COVID. I wish it didn't exist, yeah. but it has. But what have we learned from it? Because, you know, when something bad happens, we can wallow in self-pity. We can, you know, be stuck over there. But the way I look at it is, what can we learn from this? Mm. What has it shown us? The importance of vitamin D3, which has always been ignored. The importance of lung health. The importance of if you have diabetes, it's not okay. Do something about it. Mm. Make it better. But it's your job. You can't just be on meds and say, I'm fine. Because today, these are the cases which are being hurt the most. Mm. So COVID has taught us that on a technical front. Number two, it's also shown us two parts, two, you know, two populations of people. People lost their jobs. People's businesses crashed. There's one population that slipped into depression and another that have made new businesses. Mm. You know, same problem, different mindsets. There are some wow. people who lost their job and they said, we'll never go back to work. They've built online businesses, new revenue streams. So you see, they've taken, they've taken difficulties and challenging times and they've converted it into profitability, into a new life. Why? Perspective, mind change, mm. mindset, strength. Mm. So COVID's brought out so much. It's been good for the world in terms of pollution and so many different things. It's made us all realize how vulnerable we are. You know, we can't, no medicines worked. Okay, so we turn back to nature. Mm. We turn back, immunity became a buzzword. Mm. You know, before immunity was never even discussed 
for five years, we've been screaming immunity. <laughs> but people were like, what's immunity? What's yeah. immunity? Today, it's a buzzword. Yeah. So you see, sometimes the world has to change to bring out the best of what is actually real to us. Mm. The basics of life, the mm. basics of human life is immunity. If you have low immunity, you can get any disease. So I think lockdown's been fabulous. Mm. It's been fabulous. You know, that's what we can take away from it right now. Yeah, uh, I think there were two things that came to the forefront. The first was <clears throat> a live feel. I feel there's mm -hmm. different people with different levels of fear inside them. Yep. And you got to see in your own friend circles, okay, who are the ones who live a fearful life mm -hmm. versus who are the ones who just go for it. Right. That's one thing that came to the forefront. The second thing that came to the forefront from a professional standpoint, but also from a life standpoint, is mental toughness in people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that the narrative over the last five, five years or so has been about mental health. And mm -hmm. it's important. And we will be touching upon that in this podcast as well. What's not spoken about enough, kudos mm -hmm. to someone called David Goggins, what's not spoken about is mental toughness. Right. I feel that's going to be the next big thing in the world. We've called it mental fitness mm -hmm. in the past. I had to... Right term mental toughness as mental fitness on the channel for this reason that the moment you say oh be tough people yeah. think it's an attack on the conversation Absolutely. of mental health yeah. mm -hmm. and that's why I said no no not toughness no. it's mental fitness but that's all the more reason you need to stand with this point because what is mental awareness we're aware that depression is at its highest. Mm. We're aware that suicides, that teenage problems, adult problems, senior citizen problems and is at the problem. Mental awareness is not gonna fix it. Mm. Mental toughness is gonna fix it. Yeah. Yes, I'm sad. Now, what are you gonna do about it? Mm. Okay, we're not disrespecting that you're sad, but what action are you gonna take? Oh yes, my girlfriend or my boyfriend broke up with me. Yes, I empathize with you. No one likes heartbreak, but now what are you gonna do? Mm. Are you gonna stay stuck? Or are you gonna move on? You need mental toughness, or like you're coining a word, mental fitness, you need it, or mental awareness is useless. Mm. People are aware of their emotions. I don't know anyone who isn't aware of their emotions. Mm. The thing lacking is action. Mm. They're stuck, they're not moving forward. Yeah. So yeah, and you're, you're absolutely right. So when we say, you gotta suck it up and be tough, people are like, oh, because you're emotionally yeah. weak. Mm. You have to be emotionally strong. Yeah. Weakness cannot be accepted. It can be worked with. Mm. Yes, we can accept it, but now we need to move to action. We can't accept it and do nothing about it. Mm. Then we're creating a failing model in society yeah. where yeah. people only get the year what they want a year. Like, oh, you went through a breakup. Yes, he shouldn't have done that. She shouldn't have done that. Here, come, let's go shop. Let's go numb our pain by you know smoking a joint, drinking more alcohol. No, you've created a mentally weak society. Mm. But you need someone to say, yep, okay, you know, go home, feel bad, go through the feelings. But tomorrow, get up and move on with your life. Yeah. It's difficult. No one is saying it is easy, but you got to do it. Yeah, that is mental toughness. It's needed. There's a yeah. very small section of urban audiences, I believe, mm -hmm. that uh, really, really highlights the darkness of mental health and mm -hmm. that whole mental health conversation. Right. Um, I, I want you to highlight that. Like, I know this whole podcast is about your story and mm -hmm. I know that mental toughness has been a part of your journey. Yeah. You're someone who always looks at the positive side of things. So yeah. that's not a part of your life that you highlight often. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to highlight some of your own dark times as well in this conversation. Sure. And right before you do that, again, I've got to highlight David Goggins, man. Yeah. Like, uh, I discovered him through Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan's podcast. Okay. That guy has a catchphrase, mm -hmm. David Goggins. He says, stay hard. Mm -hmm. And that's that's so important, yeah. especially in the modern day. Yeah. You know, if you, like, I think before COVID or even during the lockdown, mm -hmm. if you promoted the idea of mental toughness, you had this entire section of urban audiences coming at you and saying yeah. that, how dare you say that? But you know what? You know where all the problems are in? That urban audience, mm. emotionally weak and unstable. When I say this, I don't mean it in a disrespective way. I'm here to correct a problem. Mm. I'm here, if I have a patient in front of me, the only thing I see is your recovery. Mm -hmm. If you are becoming an obstacle to it, it's my job to break it down. Yeah. If you don't want to break it down, that's your part. I'm not going to force you. Mm. So all the people who come and say, oh no, you need to be compassionate. Yes, compassion and toughness go together. But you'll see all the problems when people attack you from a particular standpoint on social media. What? Those are the audiences that have the problem. You can see it right there. And then I see it and I know you're on the right path. Keep moving forward. So stay hard. Yeah. Okay. It's a fantastic phrase. But, you know, a lot of groups are going to say, like, that's too, you know, callous. That's too rough. But it's the truth. Yeah. And most people want honesty and the truth. But you know where they fail, Ranveer? No one can take it. Mm. The biggest issue in relationships, I want honesty. 
but they can't take it when they get honesty. <laughs> so you build up white lies, you build up walls because you want to satisfy your partner emotionally. Yeah. Whereas the easiest thing for a guy or girl is to be yourself and be honest, mm. but the other party has to be able to take it. Yeah. So stay hard is great, but people have to see it in the perspective of, yes, we empathize you have a problem. We're not disregarding the pain you're going through, but you have to stay hard. That's the mm. only way you stay afloat, right? Mm. So there's a lot of wisdom in that for sure. Yeah, uh, you speak about online trolls or just mm -hmm. trolls in general, doubters and haters in mm -hmm. life. People only point out the negatives that they see within themselves. So if Absolutely. they feel something negative about themselves, like for example, the most common, uh, I'm sure even you get this because you're mm -hmm. associated with the world of fitness, mm -hmm. someone somewhere will be criticizing something about you, yeah. your knowledge or your body. Mm -hmm. But actually, somewhere deep within themselves, they're criticizing their own knowledge and their own body. They're projecting. They're, exactly. They're projecting their insecurities on you. Mm. And you know, trolls are basically, I mean, everyone tries to define trolls. They're cowards. Mm. And I'll tell you why. Again, coward is a word. Okay, and if someone tells me today, Luke, you know, you behave like a coward. For me, I want to know what part of that behavior it was and change it because mm. I don't want to be a coward. So I'm mm. taking it positively. But trolls, because they know they don't have to come face to face. They attack and they project. Mm. Now, face to face, they will never be able to project their insecurities on someone. Mm. So social media has given a platform to people to hide behind the screen and project. Yeah. Because if you want to give constructive criticism, you can still use the platform. Mm. But when someone's trolling, it's a very, very deeply rooted negative in them yeah. that they project. And you know, a lot of people ask me, Ranveer, I'm sure you've gone through it. It affects us. Why? And it should affect us. You know why? Because... The brain works on survival. Anything that threatens our peace, our happiness, our safety, the mind is on alert. Mm. So if you've ever noticed, I'm going through 500 comments of love and thing, but the mind will pick up that one troll and focus. Mm. And people say, oh, be strong, Luke, I'm trying to be strong. No, no, it's natural what's happening. Mm. Threat to survival, negative threat. The brain perceives it, perceives it as a threat. Now, what you're going to do it is up to you, whether you're going to take it on, ignore it or whatever. But a lot of people feel, but why is it affecting me, Luke? I shouldn't. I'm meditating every day. It will affect you mm. because your brain is focused on survival. Anything that's a threat, it will focus its attention on that. Yeah. But all the other 300 comments of love and appreciation is not a threat. Mm. So it's not going to stimulate that same thing. So when we accept this, we don't put ourselves down for like, I need to meditate more because this affected me today. No, it was meant to affect you. Now, how attached you are to that is your decision. Mm. So if you're attach, attached and entangled, then maybe you need to meditate more, chant more to uh, detach. Yeah. But if yeah. you're not, you see it, you recognize it as a threat, take action, block, do what you want and move on. Mm. So, yeah. but the troll thing is nothing but projection. These people are angry or <laughs> they're trying to be you mm. or they want to be better than you or what you've achieved is what they've never been able to achieve. Mm. So the only thing that they can do is try to pull you down. Yeah. And they can't do it physically, so they do it behind yeah. screen. I think this kind of a clip from this particular episode is very important for the times that we live in because everyone's yeah. become a content creator now. That's yeah. what they say about the 2020s. Yeah. Like every single human has become a content creator. Yeah. Uh, you know, man, I know you, I think for like two, three years now, maybe. And yeah. you've always guided me at some important uh, junctures in my life. I've never really, really asked you about the guy, Luke. I've always looked at you as, for lack of a better word, a bhaiya, like, you know, a big bro. Uh, but I've never asked you about what you were like when you were my age, what you were like in your mid-twenties. And I feel like you've gone through some shit that you don't address. Mm -hmm. So this whole podcast is about that shit, man, that you don't put out online. Because I, you do, I, I know that you speak from your heart and every single piece of content that you put up online, <clears throat> It's actually what you're feeling in the present. Mm -hmm. And you're someone who doesn't really focus on your past. Mm -hmm. You don't even call your struggle phase a struggling phase. Mm -hmm. um, what happened? Like, take us back to that. I mean, I know you don't like using that word, but take us back to that struggle. Like in your early 20s, mid 20s. Bro, I'll be really, really honest with you. When I look at this, okay, I've never had a struggle. I've never seen anything as a struggle. You know, I think, like, so if you ask me my story, there's no story. I'm probably in chapter two or chapter three, and I don't know what's gonna happen the next year. I've gone with the flow, always. Go back to my DJ years. I never knew I would do this. One, okay? one second. Yeah. I just wanna give the audience some context. Okay. Your health career started at age 34. Yes. How old do you know? I am now 41. 41, so yeah. that's like what, seven years? Yeah, seven years. So 2014, 2013? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
what happened in the pre 2013 2014 phase and and like you had like sort of a meteoric rise in this whole health world okay so i'm i'm going to call it out right now because i don't have a story i was an ibm okay you know about to become a deputy general manager and you know that whole <laughs> thing you want to become a gm and a vp and all of that stuff and you always look at the people above you you know mm-hmm. the vps the senior managers traveling business class all over the world important meetings and stuff and i would just look at their lives one had cholesterol one had diabetes one had whatever and i was like <laughs> you know it doesn't make sense there was one who couldn't even fit into the seat of a business class seat. wow so i was like you know something's wrong what is wrong over here Okay, I identified a gap. Okay, I have to tell you one point. I wouldn't see it as a struggle. I see it as a blessing because that was shape that's what shaped my career. I was into hardcore operations in IBM. I had this boss, his name was Vikas Verma, okay? And one day he came to me and said, "Look, you're going to fail in operations because you don't like numbers. Operation is all about Excel." And I don't. He identified something that I was just trying to be good at because to succeed in operations, you got to be good at P&L and all of that stuff. He said, "You know what? I'm going to move you into learning and development." because you know how to teach you know you know you speak well and all of that stuff so i was upset that night like you know he discovered like a truth of mine but he had the guts to call it out the next day i told him yeah let's move i moved to learning and development beautiful position in ibm i had a lot more time to pursue my studies in nutrition so that was one thing that happened two is if he had not pulled me out there i would still be in the struggle of the corporate ladder yeah yeah so if you see he pulled me out of a struggle which he identified it i didn't see as a struggle for me it was like you know rat race rat race okay f- fake it through the meetings pretend you understand numbers and stuff like that i didn't and then i moved into learning and development i had a lot more time to study and that's when i started i was working more closely with the vps and stuff mm. i noticed a gap that these people have the worst lifestyles yeah. So I was at the junction of my career. Do I want to get into nutrition, pediatrics, integrative medicine, all of these things? And I said, there's enough of all of this happening in the world, but no one is teaching people lifestyle, how to live, mm. how to. If you're busier, what do you need to do to stay busy, successful, but keep your health? Mm. That was the game changer in my life, Ranveer. I took lifestyle, got into lifestyle medicine, integrative medicine, merged everything together, and just filled a gap that no one was filling. Mm. No one was filling. So honestly, I've just been flowing through life, and wherever I see a gap, and I feel if I fill it, there's going to be impact. I jump into it. Mm. I don't even look to see what's going to happen and stuff. So two months, I, I started seeing patients and stuff, and I said, when I was probably earning about what eighty thousand rupees at that time, and I said, okay, fine, plus PF, plus all of this. So when I hit one lakh in my client consults. that's the time i leave mm. okay but one night i realize why am i so fearful about this i know i'm good my clients are increasing i'm changing their lives and stuff i said let me just resign and see what happens mm. best decision of my life from 1 lakh it went up to like 10 lakhs the next month to 15 lakhs like you know it's just that fear you got to overcome fear yeah so i know i can't think of a story i had a great childhood mm. i mean everyone i'm in a family where my parents fought but it's not it we're not damaged because of that i'm mm. happy i saw it because i can relate to other families as well and yeah. realize that fighting is real people are different yeah. but what you can learn from that my parents are still together mm. they learn to forgive we're back as a family we've grown up seeing forgiveness happen maybe that's where we loki connect on a subconscious level ah you cool. didn't know that about me i didn't know that about oh, you nice. until this point but i have a like exact reflective parallel journey to what you just said Any friends? Let's go on. <laughs> Family, kids, brothers and sisters. We still fight. I'm in Goa for a year, staying with my parents. That's why I went back to Goa. Okay, now I left home at the age of 18, and I'm going back at 41 and staying with them. There are going to be differences, adjustments, staying. I fought with my dad several times over this one year, but by dinner time we're fine, and it's so healthy, mm. you know. So I think there's so much learning. But you see today that urban audience that you speak about, oh, there's a fight. Okay, let's get a <laughs> therapist. Let's get a counselor. I mean, screw it. You know, I mean, I, I no disrespect to counselors. Some people need it, but mm. what are you doing to figure it out? So has the world projected a perfect family to you that doesn't fight? a perfect relationship where people don't go wrong yeah that's the projection of the world and that's where the suffering breeds from yeah so a child today who has always been told that oh you're beautiful you're the best and they step out into the real world and people say we don't give up about you mm. you know you're no one yeah and so and then they're like i need a therapist mm. i need a therapist no one loves me no one appreciates me mm. emotionally weak society mm. okay blame the parents blame society blame whatever and stuff like that love your child but when you need to discipline them you need to discipline them you need to call a spade a spade that's part of our bringing yeah. you know so i think 
I've not gone through a struggle. Do I have a dark side of my life? Of course, absolutely. I've done my share of stuff and whatever, but I can tell you, if I had not done that today, I wouldn't be who I am. Because mm. again, there's a lesson to take. Of course, I've not killed anyone, not done anything bad that way. But you know what guys do as we grow up, all of that stuff. I've had my share of broken relationships where I've broken them. I've two-timed, I've three-timed, I've gone through it, okay? Yes, maybe I shouldn't have caused the pain, but there's a lesson. What is the lesson? Okay, your actions cause hurt. Small lesson, everyone deals with it. But for me, who was I at that point? Mm. Why couldn't I be satisfied? Why couldn't I be? So I can look back at those relationships and say, I was never in love. Don't fool yourself thinking that just because you're in a relationship, you're in love. For me, it was curiosity, it was wonder, it was fun and all of that stuff. But accepting that today makes me more mature when I'm able to handle relationship problems of my clients and tell them, it's okay, mm. it's okay. Don't think you messed up everything. It is okay. If you're beating up your girlfriend or you're beating up your husband, that happens too. Wow. <laughs> That's not okay. But if there's a problem, fix it. You don't want to fix it, don't stay. Mm. As simple as that. You don't need a, a, if you don't have the will to fix something, you don't need a counselor to try to fix that. You've made up your mind. Mm. No one can change that. Walk out. Yeah. So but the dark phases in my life is that, but I cover it with light as quickly as possible because I'll tell you what, whoever I've worked with, everyone, we, we, you, me, all of us, we have a bright side and we have a dark side. Be aware of your dark side. Is it harming someone? Is it harming you? Is it draining you? All of that stuff. You know, aim it, do what you want. Otherwise we do have brights and dark side. Now you mm. want to grow brighter so the darker, it, you know, it becomes less dark. Yeah. Everyone has it, but everyone's trying to be too good all the time. Mm. Everyone's trying to be like, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. And I say, what about this, this, this? Your life is boring <laughs> if you're only this, this, this and stuff. Why are you ashamed of talking about it or whatever? That's what makes life beautiful. Mm. That's what makes life beautiful. So I really don't think I have a struggle in my life yeah. at all. My biggest struggle is Mumbai traffic, which is now <laughs> sorted because I'm in Goa. You know, I don't, I don't know how to handle it. It frustrates me. Two hours, I can be, I can see like, like four patients, five yeah. patients. I'm not learned to deal with it. I'll meditate, I'll chant, whatever. But it's fixed. I'm in Goa right now. I, I don't have a Mumbai uh, traffic struggle right now. Well, my, my immediate solution for that problem yeah. in my life is I'm going to sit in my car and I'm going to make content. Okay. Like I'm just yeah. going to so record cool. myself doing something. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the immediate solution. Yeah. But you know, from everything you said, yeah. there's so many aspects I wish to highlight. There's a lot of people listening to this podcast right now who are like, yo, highlight the <clears> relationships <throat> part. I want to know more about Luke's relationships. Yeah. Just so you know, that's going to be another whole <clears throat> episode that we'll record <laughs> after this. Therefore, I'm going to go back to the theme of this podcast, which is mental toughness. Right. Uh, I'm going to say something contro controversial that might get me into some trouble, but I'm mm -hmm. saying it in a very general way. You highlighted this whole aspect of therapists and yeah. psychologists who've dedicated mm -hmm. their entire life to helping yes. people and their mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that they know about the human mind way deeper than people from other professions. Right. Um, but, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm asking you this question. I'm not making any statements. Yeah. Do you believe that the human mind is uh, limited enough for someone to take all aspects of it and put it inside a textbook? Because, it's impossible. Yeah, I, I mm -hmm. personally believe, especially with psychology students, I've spoken to a few students studying at Mumbai University. They're very arrogant about the stuff they read in their textbooks. For example, I know that there's a textbook in Mumbai University that actually just kind of calls meditation false. Mm -hmm. It calls meditation fake. Mm -hmm. That's not what Navel Ravi Khan says. That's mm -hmm. not what Luke Coutinho says. Mm -hmm. That's not what my experiences have taught me. I've had right. some out of body experiences in meditation. Mm -hmm. I have seen my own mental health get better over time through consistent meditation. Mm -hmm. I've seen my mental toughness increase through meditation. Right. And I feel that experience is the biggest teacher. Mm -hmm. Honestly, maybe that was my own subjective experience, but I don't believe that psychology textbooks completely encapsulate the human mm -hmm. mind. And I have met some fantastic psychologists, some fantastic therapists who have learned through the experience of coaching or yes. mentoring other yeah. people. And I feel that like that's what teaches them the most. Mm -hmm. But never limit your perspective on things because of the textbooks that you've read. So Absolutely. Textbooks are guides. Like, mm -hmm. Let's go back to medical science, okay? Anatomy is my favorite subject, but it gives me information and knowledge on how your heart works. What will happen if your creat levels go up? Mm. What happens if you have plaque in your brain? You know, it's great as a benchmark, okay? Anatomy in a book. Your, that's a book 
structure is right, everything is good. But you are constantly changing. Mm. Okay, just because anatomy says that a plaque will happen in the age groups of 50 to 60, okay, doesn't mean we start looking at it only when you're 50 to 60. It's a process that has started probably when you're 30 mm. because you have low vitamin B12, you're, not, you're sleep deprived, example. That's where the book, it's great, but that's where it ends. Mm. Now for me, I wanna know how can I prevent that plaque from coming in your brain? So I'm gonna look beyond that. Mm. But just because science isn't looking beyond that and they haven't put the pieces together doesn't mean you're wrong. Mm. So psychology, yes, there's a process, there's a book and all of that stuff, but your brain is constantly evolving and changing every second, okay? How can you just take textbook knowledge and put it into a solution for your brain and your emotional problem, mm. okay? Someone's going through a divorce, it's the same thing. Accept it, start going out, start doing this, start doing it. No, what about you? How are you changing? What role did you play in your own suffering? Mm. They're trying to make you feel better all the time by taking responsibility out of you. But when it comes down to depression, even, and, and a lot of people who are depressed, they don't like when I say this, it's your responsibility at the end of the day. Take help, take a coach, go to a psychologist. I have psychologists on my team. That's why we say integrative medicine. I know a psychologist cannot fix my patient alone without us looking at their meditation on one side, their yoga. So if my psychologist doesn't believe in meditation, that's fine. You do your bit. My meditation teacher will take over and teach this person meditation mm. because it is needed. So that's what integrative medicine, that is what we do. We take the patient what you need, not what the textbook says, mm. okay? We won't break the rules of the textbook. But if I feel Ranveer needs a higher protein diet and a higher carb diet because he's carb efficient, I'm not gonna look at a textbook that says, oh, low carb is the best. <laughs> you know, because if I put a CGM monitor on you and I find out that you are carb efficient, guess what? You're gonna lose more weight with carbs. Mm. So I'm treating you as an individual. Yeah. I'm using the knowledge of the textbook. So you are absolutely right. People who put, and see, that's the difference between a successful psychologist and a psychologist who's not so successful. Mm. My point is everyone studied the same thing. All of you all should be A-class psychologists. What's the difference? Curiosity? Curiosity and experience. Mm. One person goes beyond and uses experience and textbook knowledge. The other person who, who's probably not made it yet is still stuck in a textbook and mm. is trying to fit the patient in a box in the textbook. Mm. It can never ever work that yeah. way. I always give the simple example. 100 A plus doctors will pass out of Harvard and Yale Medical College every year. How many of them will make it as the most successful doctors? Two, three or four, why not 100? Same textbook, same knowledge, same professors. What's the difference? The person, mm. the experience, how much they went the extra mile to fuse everything together and give a result. Yeah. But those who are still stuck in this textbook, textbook writing articles about saturated fat is bad for you. <laughs> you know, like still articles coming out from leading institutes across the world. Uh, you know, that's what yeah. I mean. They're, they're textbook, you know, bound. Yeah. And that's the problem. So look, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, now this is from my fitness only days when I used to only create fitness content. I had to deep dive into mm -hmm. fitness. And uh, what I realized is that there's multiple schools of thought mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to fitness, some of which are extremely contradictory. Mm -hmm. uh, now there's also multiple studies that mm -hmm. back those multiple schools. Mm -hmm. So school A will say, oh keto, uh, no carb. Yeah. And there's lots of studies that back that. And then yeah. school B will say, say mm -hmm. vegan. Right. You know, oh, and there's studies that back that. Yeah. School C will say balanced, and there's studies that back yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, studies are something that you can manipulate, right? Yeah. Like you can change certain Absolutely. factors. Because yeah. that's wh what my learning was. When I mm -hmm. deep dived into stuff, people used factors in those studies to come to conclusions, right. uh, which could easily be twisted. As yeah. in, they chose factors that were obviously more beneficial to the conclusion they wanted to reach. Absolutely, yeah. And that's why I realized that, yo, you can't really rely on these fitness studies mm -hmm. for uh, the ultimate truth. Yeah. And then the more I worked with clients, the more I met people like yourself. I realized that it's so subjective. What works for a particular mind or a particular body or mm -hmm. a particular weight loss experience for someone or weight gain experience for someone right. is very subjective to the individual. And you can't say that, oh, there's a study that's come out. That's yeah. why I'm saying it. Oh, there's a book that's come out. That's why yeah. I'm saying it. But we have top fitness professionals. Mm -hmm. We have people who own fitness academies putting up 
you know, stuff that only backs school A or school B or yeah. school C or school D. And their whole life becomes centered around yeah. that. And they're not willing to accept that the human body is different for everyone. Mm-hmm. And uh, what you said about, you know, the, with integrative medicine, you have a team now. Mm-hmm. And the team approaches the same problem from five directions. Correct. Yes. This is so much more a team sport where different experiences and different learnings come together and help that one person. Yeah. Because that one person has such a varied subjective experience. Versus only one person helping your patient yeah. and saying that, oh, I've studied this school A, so you've got to listen to school A. Yeah. Am I right in saying this? Yeah, absolutely right. And let me give you an example. Okay, most of the studies are manipulated. We know that today. Okay, today, I mean, the more and more you see it on the news, top studies have been manipulated. People have been paid thousands and thousands of US dollars to manipulate. And because it comes with from a recognized institute, everyone believes, we would like to believe. Mm-hmm. That would be an ideal world where we don't have to do the thinking, okay? So you can't base your dynamics, you're made up of physiology, biology, chemistry on a study. Now I will use a study if today one of my patients is on a blood thinner, okay? And an Ayurvedic doctor says, hey, listen, I wanna put you on ashwagandha. Mm -hmm. I wanna know how they contradict. I will look at studies Mm -hmm. to see what's possibly come safe and then make a decision because you never know even how that's going to interact in the body. So that can give me some base to a decision. But all these studies of fitness, Go back, look at people like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, all of these things, Dorian Yates. Do you think they even referred to one study in their life? They followed a principle of progression. Mm. Okay, more protein, more progression, more muscle tear, and I have muscle build. Mm. A principle which they believed in and they went through this. Mm. Do you think at the start of Arnold Schwarzenegger's career, they even had as many studies as we Mm. have? You see, I've noticed another thing. A lot of people today, they're not connected inwards. They don't, they're scared to make a decision using their own logic and they don't they want to think. So they hide behind studies. They go to extremes. Like I have nothing against vegans, carnivores, I don't know. But a lot of these people, it's a sense of identity for them. Mm. I'm vegan, mm. I'm carnivore, I'm whatever. Be what you want, stay calm. <laughs> Is it working for you? Okay, don't say I'm vegan and then come to me and say I have this issue, I'm carnivore and then come to say I have cholesterol issues. Be humble about it. If it suits you, it works for you, beautiful, go. Don't try and change the world by coming up with 10 studies which can also be proven completely wrong by another department. So I think people are wasting their lives behind these studies trying to push things out. It's ego at the end. It's ego and no, it's it's way deeper than that. It's it's an attention seeking mechanism. I'll tell you why. You only move to extremes when you want a sense of identity. There's nothing wrong with keto. Suits you, do it. Okay? If it's not sustainable, don't do it. Change to something else. Go back 10, 15, 20 years. Did our did the people in that generation need a study to tell them what to eat or were they more intuitive? Okay, when I eat more fat and protein, I have mental clarity. I lose weight. I feel good. That's my diet. Mm. Okay? Oh, I feel better on carbs. I'm going to eat carbs. Oh, I feel horrible when I'm sitting at home and not working out. They were intuitive. And everyone has a different body. Mm. So I can't go out and say low carb is the way forward. I have diabetics eating medium carbs and they're doing fantastically Mm. well. Mm. I have people who go low carb and their blood sugar levels, you know, plummet down. And they have bigger problems when they wake up in the morning. Mm. Everyone is individual. So hiding behind a study, see, it can possibly give you that, that move to move into a direction, but you claim and you, you know, <laughs> grasp onto that study, no, it's right, and you ask them three or four, like ask them one question, why are you doing this? And most of them don't have an answer to why. Like, oh no, no, but vegan is good, but why, why are you doing it? Mm. So someone says, oh, I bloat up when I have milk and stuff, super answer. But most people, oh, I don't, mm. uh, you know, there are studies that say this, like, <laughs> why you? So I'm saying, see, there are good studies as well, but most of them can be controlled. My point is, when it comes to things like lifestyle, you don't need a study to tell you to meditate. You don't need a study to tell you to do deep breathing exercises. This is common sense. You don't need a study to tell you these things. Mm. My point is if you're connected inwards and you're listening, your body is talking to you all the time. Hey, what you ate didn't make me feel good, but you're going on eating the same stuff, stupidity. And then you want to look at studies and go on to an extreme measure where the only change was you're overeating. Mm. You don't need an extreme change. You need to stop overeating. 
So I think we've lost that intuitive skill because that's unfortunately what social media and everything does, right? We're connected outwards. Mm. So we don't know how to connect in and rely on our own inner voice. Like, look, there's a breakup today or a girl wants a breakup or a boy or a boy wants a breakup. They have to speak to 10 friends for validation. Mm. My point is, what do you want to do? Oh, I don't know. I, how can you not know what you want to do? So that means you are going to base your entire relationship on 10 of your friends. They're opinions. They're not facts. There's a big difference. What is your feeling? They can't even, they need validation to even make a decision of whether I should see this boy or this girl or break up. Mm. You know, and that, that's dangerous society. Yeah. That's very dangerous. Yeah. Because people are going to change. Opinions are going to change. Mm. Facts stay the same. Yeah. So we have to lean more towards facts. <sighs> so, you know what, man? Like, um... I was scanning some of Monk Entertainment's mm. young talents. Mm -hmm. Now there's these bunch of Mumbai kids, mm -hmm. 18 years old, 19 years old. They mm -hmm. came out with this little podcast. Uh, this guy called Dave Rayani and a friend of mine, Tanisha. Okay. They were 18. They, they are 18. And they are speaking about some really deep shit. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, I didn't think like this when I was 18. Mm -hmm. And they say that like these kids who are 18 years old. Mm -hmm. One of them was talking about the younger sister okay. who's 13 years old. And they said that, oh, my 13 year old sister is way more different than I am. Mm -hmm. She's even more intelligent, <clears throat> even deeper. She thinks differently at 13 than I did. Mm -hmm. A 13 year old of 2021 is what, born in 2008, mm -hmm. where Facebook was at its peak. Yeah. She was born into a world of social media. She was born mm -hmm. into a world of information. Mm -hmm. So I feel that that generation is a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. Double-edged sword, that's what it's called. Yeah, absolutely. Two-sided sword. Ways. Yep. That absolutely. You'll be extremely intelligent yeah. and deep. Mm -hmm. Slash, you will have so much information that will mess you up. Yeah. Um, that's the world we're going into. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, for some reason, because of what happened in the lockdown and people went so much within themselves, I am a little optimistic about that generation yeah. after mm -hmm. lockdown. Mm -hmm. Before the lockdown, I would have said, no, no, I'm a little worried for you guys. Yeah. I feel people have, people are kind of awakening to mm -hmm. intuition again and yeah. concepts of going within yourself, looking within yourself, mm -hmm. concepts like meditation. People are understanding that how yes. it's something that can add to your mental fitness, add to your mental toughness. The generations that have taken a hit are the 90s born generations mm -hmm. and the 80s born generation, right. which is mine. Mm -hmm. And I see that around me. Mm -hmm. I go to a, a Soho house. I go to a club. Mm -hmm. I speak to me, people my age, people a little older than me mm -hmm. who are dealing with Tons of divorces, tons mm -hmm. of, you know, just general issues. These 20 years, 1980 to 1999, mm -hmm. people born in that phase are probably the most, I'd say mentally weak almost, man. Mm -hmm. uh, which is exactly why I want to highlight your life again. Yeah. What was mm -hmm. your 20s like? Were you, were you thinking about some really big shit? Because like you've achieved kind of the dream for a lot of health professionals. Mm -hmm. So in your 20s, were you putting pressure on yourself? Because that's what Never. this generation is. I went with the flow. In in my 20s, I didn't know what I wanted to do. But were you were you visualizing your life? Never. Mm. I learned vis visualization only when I saw how it worked on my patients. I began to believe on it, mm. in it. Uh, See, when you, I, you know what? I can share this truth. Mm. Uh, I wasn't a good student. And this is not negative self-talk. Okay, when I say that, I'm going to tell you why I wasn't a good student. I couldn't understand complication. I couldn't understand anything that was complicated. My brain could pick up things which were simple and, you know, thrive on that, okay? Which so, is true knowledge. Which is true knowledge, okay? So I was really bad in math, physics, barely scraped through class, all of that stuff. So even when I moved into this field, everyone around me couldn't believe that I can talk like, you know, medical science the way I do it today. I reflected on this, what changed in me? I wasn't aspiring for it. I didn't have this dream. I want to be this, you know, health professional. Absolutely not. You know what I realized? And this is my truth. Because my brain can't see complication, I can look at the most complicated problem and my brain will try to simplify it so I can understand it. Mm. So you come with me with a ton of reports and a ton of symptoms. My brain is going to look for the simplest things that could have caused this. And build on it. And, often, and that's my success. Yeah. And people aren't willing to accept that. That the complicated problems can be that simple. The, all my complicated cases. I mean, I have medical doctors on my team today who say, look, the complicated cases are solved by the simplest solutions. For that, you've got to be hard to accept the truth. Mm -hmm. So if I'm here to tell you today that your hormonal imbalance, not you, is because of sleep deprivation, I am telling you the truth. 
Now, you not wanting to believe it doesn't change the truth. Mm. So the people who believe it, they're like, Luke, my endometriosis has disappeared. I don't need surgery. Am I a genius? No. I just told you something which makes sense to me, which is the truth, which can also be backed by studies. <laughs> Example, for the people who will want to study that, oh, I need to sleep well. Mm. Okay, that's it. So for me, I have taken a weakness which I thought was always a weakness and today that's become my biggest strength, my biggest strength. So if my CFO comes up with a complicated business expansion plan, okay, I'll just tell him, simplify it in five bullet points. And if it makes sense to me, do it. If it doesn't make sense, I don't wanna be involved in it. Yeah. I don't wanna be pulled into complication. So that's honestly my only thing, you know? So if I look back, that's why I always say, it's never a struggle. I mean, because I've always looked at it, if it's a struggle, I've made it into something which is super, super beneficial for me. Yeah. And that's, you know, you keep saying I'm positive, that's how it is. I mean, mm. whatever mistakes I've seen, I've taken away with it. I can't change who may have gotten hurt in the process. I can't, I can intend not to do that again, mm. but I can only move forward and see who I was at that point, who she was at that point, who the patient was at that point, and build a new story out of it. Yeah. So technically in my 20s, let me go back to my 20s. What was I doing? Um, in 20s, I probably hit Dubai at that point. I got selected for an interview. I went in for a base position interview, but I decided to put the higher position, like a team leader, okay? And I got selected. And everyone was like, you don't even have a year of experience. But the truth is, I got selected. So mm. I moved at a higher position to Dubai. Yeah. From Dubai, I moved to London. From London, I came back to India. From there, I went back to Dubai. I was just going with the flow. Didn't know what I wanted to do until I finished 10 years in IBM. That's when life hit me. And I believe that if life hit me with this health professional in my 25s, I would have failed. I didn't have maturity. I didn't have drive and the want to make that my thing. Mm. So I believe life pushed me through this journey, which is zero. People say, Luke, what if you started this when you were 24? I said, I wouldn't be successful. I was not meant to do this at 24. There's a time and place for everyone in life for everyone. And I grew up with my dad telling me that. He said, don't try to push your time before. Mm. There's a time and place. It is planned. It is written. You can't change that. You can't change certain things in life. And today, I, I wouldn't change anything in my past at all. Yeah. I wouldn't change anything. Yeah. Um, I definitely want to ask you a lot about your business journey because I sure. believe that the same mindset that you use to go this deep into mm. the world of health, you have used it to some extent in your business career as well, mm -hmm. in your professional life. Uh, but before that, I just wanna highlight three things that I get from your journey. Yeah. The first is that you're a forever learner. That's mm -hmm. the most Absolutely. basic. Absolutely, never stop learning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. that's your biggest strength also. And I feel that uh, that's something very underrated in the modern day because mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. when you're in a scientific field like medicine mm -hmm. or engineering, you're always told in college that uh, Oh, if you want to make it big, you've got to learn a crazy amount. And that mm -hmm. process of learning is kind of made fearful for a lot of mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. But when you actually get out in the real world and you begin your learning process, you realize, oh, it was just this? Yeah. <laughs> I figured it out. Yeah. When, for example, if you think of um, Elon Musk who's creating SpaceX, mm -hmm. he taught himself rocket science. And oh. on a podcast with Joe Rogan, he's explained rocket science in detail mm -hmm. in simple words. Mm -hmm. That, okay, this is what you need. This is how I figured it out. And you realize that even something as complicated as rocket science is just about grit in that learning process. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing I want to highlight about you. The second thing I want to highlight about you is probably something you don't give yourself enough credit for, mm -hmm. which is maybe genetic, maybe due to childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. You're a great communicator. You're a great mm -hmm. orator, which again is why you probably got selected as a team leader. Yeah. And the third thing is, um, again, it kind of highlights that learning process, but it's a quote of Steve Jobs that stayed with me all my life. Mm -hmm. So Steve Jobs said that this one quote changes his entire life. He says that the moment you realize that the entire world was created by people no smarter than yourself mm -hmm. is where everything changes, changes for you. Yeah. Where once you realize that you can create a world Absolutely. that works according to your rules, that's where everything changes. But you need to have the balls to think that way. So, I think you need guts. Yeah. See, no fear. You got to put fear on the side. Like a lot of people say, Luca, you know, you're the best. And like, no, I say... I'm the best in my mind. I have to be, it's not in an arrogant way. Mm. You know, people around me can be, be, be better. I can learn from them, all of that. But when I'm treating a patient, if I don't think I'm the best in my mind, how am I gonna treat a cancer patient? Yeah. I have to be the best in my mind, open to learning, mm. not the best that I know at all. That's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really bad attitude. Thinking you're the best 
and that no one is better than you. I know there are people better around with me and I can learn from them. Mm. But when I'm treating someone, I have to be the best in my mind. Otherwise, why will you put your life in my hands yeah. if I'm not the best in my mind? So it, it comes down to your mindset at the end of the day and absolutely. And I think I've been blessed with a lot of luck. I've always been lucky. Some people say it's not lucky. Some, You know, I think what's worked for me, honestly, even I've gotten out of like, I told you, relationships, this, that, whatever. I've never done anything with the wrong intention. Mm. Even the worst things in my life that I shouldn't have done, my intention was never negative, never to harm someone, never to like, if, if I two-timed a girl, I'm telling you honestly right now, I don't care what people say, it was because I didn't know how to say no to the first girl. Mm. You know, I didn't want to hurt her. Now I know, you know, you are going to hurt her when she finds out. I just didn't know how to do it. So today when I look back, okay, I don't like confrontation. I have to learn how to be okay with confrontation. But my intention was never like, oh, wow, I can get laid on both sides. I can get this. It was never, never, ever that intention. So I believe that my luck or whatever you, you know, you call it has come always because there's been pure intention behind everything. So when people say, hey, wow, you're lucky, I just think that I never had a bad intention. Yeah. It's never been, so that's my belief. It doesn't have to be other people's stories, but this is my story. It's my belief, that's what I think has worked for me. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people who look up to us, you know, a lot of, I keep telling my fans and followers, don't try to be me. Me is working for me. Mm. You may want to take away one thing from that, but don't try to be me. I've never had a role model in my life I can't be that person, but I can take away a little bit from, you know, whoever my role models are, a little bit from Mike Tyson, a little bit from Tupac, example, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I can't say like, I want to be like them. Yeah. You can't, you can't. Yeah. So I think it comes from there. Yeah. So I have this theory about life that I've repeatedly understood is mm -hmm. the right theory. Mm -hmm. So according to me, life boils down to being a cheesecake. Mm -hmm. Okay. A cheesecake is made up of your bottom layer, which is your crusty biscuit. Mm -hmm. And then it's part. made up, it's made up also of your cheese and cream on the top, yeah. which is the other layer. It's the brown layer and the yellow layer. Mm -hmm. The brown layer is who you are as a person, mm -hmm. the crust, mm -hmm. what's inside, what's the base of it? Are you a good person? Do you have good intentions for other people? Are you doing good things in the world? Mm -hmm. The top layer is your level of domination. This mm -hmm. is something I've been teaching my team a lot because I mm -hmm. saw it as a missing link in a lot of people within my team. Mm -hmm. Domination is the spirit of backing yourself, mm -hmm. going after things, whether that's you giving your all to a relationship or you yeah. giving your all to your career, mm -hmm. mixed with domination in your learning process, mm -hmm. that chasing learning, yeah. going behind learning with everything you've got. Correct. Yeah. You mix that spirit of domination of your learning with domination with your work. Mm -hmm. That's your yellow layer of cheese. Yeah. And your crust is who you are as a person and your karma. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes a good cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's beautifully put. Beautifully put. Absolutely. Yeah. See, the crust can't really be changed. It can be built on, like mm. you said, the layers, what you put over there. It can be changed over time with a lot of, you know, going back to your childhood, changing the things that didn't work for you back then and all of those things. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's a brilliant... Yeah. Brilliant way of explaining it. Yeah. Um, which now brings me to how you applied the cheesecake to your business career, man. Like, okay. uh, because uh -huh. <clears throat> you had corporate experience, which I'm sure taught you people skills. It taught mm -hmm. you how the corporate world works. Mm -hmm. uh, again, a couple of things I want to highlight. You're not from an overly privileged khandan or anything Correct. like that. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an excuse that a lot of people use. Mm -hmm. I am from a privileged background, honestly. The best thing my dad ever did for me was the moment I got out of college, he had a tough conversation with me where he said that I will let you stay in the house that I've built. Mm -hmm. I will not give you a single rupee to begin your own thing. Mm -hmm. Your pocket money stops from today. Mm -hmm. You are going to figure out how to earn your own money. And if you want to start mm -hmm. a business, I'm not even going to give you a loan. Right. You bootstrap from the get go. Mm -hmm. While that was a tough listen for me, it put my back against the wall. And I asked myself, what are the skills that I know right now? Yeah. I studied fitness in college. I knew I could sell that fitness. Who am I going to sell that fitness to? I didn't have any clients mm -hmm. at 22. So I literally went up to people at Carter Road mm -hmm. and I kind of did a sales ploy. I mean, I was doing sales back then. I didn't know that I was doing sales, but I was selling myself. Mm -hmm. I was just speaking confidently, yeah. pointing out their flaws in mm -hmm. very positive ways, pointing out their insecurities. Told a couple of ambitious looking teenagers that, yo, maybe you need some fitness help. I'll help you. I'll be that guy for you. I get a message on my Facebook page saying, I'm interested in taking your coaching. Nice. Those are my first few clients. Yeah. And I was able to pay for myself like that. The money I made through the training, I didn't spend on partying. I mm -hmm. spent on my YouTube equipment. Mm -hmm. I spent on the train travel that I did to Bandra Nandheri. Mm -hmm. I spent on 
building my own career people often see someone from a slightly more privileged background and think that even they've had it easier i'm not saying i've had it as difficult as many people have mm-hmm. people also believe that i had a backup plan um which maybe i did man but i never went to that mentality i always went with the mentality of okay whatever yeah. that's fine i'm going to look forward i'm going to do my own thing yeah um you weren't in that position mm-hmm. you had earned money through your corporate life yeah. you had saved up some stuff and my gauge of you is that you probably gave yourself 3 to 6 months you said that okay i'm going to budget out these 3 to 6 months mm-hmm. but i'm going to dominate and go for it in terms of building my own career mm-hmm. i'm going to build my own business with this little backup of this money that i've saved right and then you backed your skills you backed your learning process yeah. you backed your sales skills you backed your idea of preparing yourself mm-hmm. is that what happened in that phase when you were switching from corporate <sighs> to business so i'm going to remove all the masks i don't think i have a mask on since i started with you anyway <laughs> okay so this is we have a pretty similar story there my dad said when you're 18 you're out of the house in my case okay uh you can go where you want whatever you do your first tattoo get your first ear piercing when you're 18 so the moment i was 18 i went got my first tattoo whatever the next day i was on a bus from goa to bombay with 200 bucks in my pocket okay uh, eh, sorry that's a lie that's a lie i had about 10 grand which was a mm. lot of money all my dj money my collected money i had a nice music system 10 grand in my pocket i headed to bombay i was lucky my mom had a place in bandra okay which i got kicked out of 6 months later because my mom's brother was a priest and uh, he wasn't too happy when he found like <laughs> a chillum in his chalice in the cupboard and stuff so i was kicked out had to rent and stuff but but super journey no regrets it was like fun okay i came i worked in a i worked in mcdonalds i was an ihm wow i was an ihm i got picked up on campus so there was this whole management course for 6 months where you come you work in all departments clean toilets do all of that stuff and then you become a management trainee stipend was 500 bucks Okay, I was at the Andheri uh, McDonald's and stuff like that. You can't live in Bombay on five hundred bucks even at that point. Mm. So I would have all my meals, burgers, shakes, all of that stuff at McDonald's. Go back home. I realized this isn't going to be it. Call centers were sprouting up in the country at that point. Okay, salary of seven thousand bucks. I said from five hundred bucks to seven thousand. Huge. Just go. And over there, you're put into this call center with loads and loads of people, party life, all of that stuff. So worked in a call center for one and a half year, time of my life, beautiful stuff. And that's when I got picked up for the interview in Dubai, mm. where they came to select call center agents. I said, let me try for the team leader position. Applied, got through, massive. So went on a slightly higher salary over there. Uh, the money I saved in Dubai and all of that stuff, I would send a little money home. I would send a little money uh, to my parents, all of that stuff. Not that they ever needed it. but uh, i felt like doing it when i came back after a couple of months in dubai i took whatever money i had saved and i bought an enfield okay absolutely no life plan at all i think i must mention my dad here he's brought us up with this word called providence and we've seen it what does that mean? always believe in providence means you're being looked after this doesn't mean you sit at home and don't work do your best but you're being looked after and i've seen providence in my dad's life like like anything he was the general manager of caterpillar you know life private jets to switzerland all that jazz and stuff like that retired at a very young age because he wanted to move back to goa and be with the kids so all of that stuff you know he did that he made his money came back we had a very very mediocre decent childhood and stuff like that but he always told us i will give you all the best education after that you're on your own because you have six siblings and i got to look after all of them okay so this providence i know, i think it's ingrained in me i always believe that as long as i'm working hard i'll be looked mm-hmm. after so i went back to london came back made a little bit of money joined ibm on a salary of maybe 20000 mm-hmm. okay worked and stuff like that now let me tell you and i and i want to i want to tell you this part of the story when i quit ibm i got married a year before one year before i quit ibm okay wow. i spent 6 lakhs on my wedding 5 to 6 with the ring and all of that jazz you know catholic weddings are not you don't have all these fancy things peaceful fun all of that stuff uh, in my total savings i would have had around maybe 15 to 16 lakhs okay mm. uh which clearly shows you i didn't really save much i didn't splurge either i lived i paid a rent in bandra i wanted to stay in bandra i paid a rent of 40000 all of that jazz and you know uh i didn't need money to start my business because my business was exactly like you when i was in ibm how do i get my first client was the biggest thing. <laughs> was luke okay we had a britisher in ibm she was managing an account and she was like luke i have all these problems so i said do this 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 sort it out she then spoke to a diamond jeweler okay whose apartment she was renting in juhu 
Okay, I don't want to mention that guy's name right now <laughs> for various reasons. He called me, okay, uh, overweight guy. He said, start working with me and stuff like that. Okay, my, my fee was like 250 bucks, 300, because I'm like trying to please people. I want him to like me for what I do. Sorted him out. Next thing I was on the plane to Belgium because the whole diamond community is there. So this guy, Luke, he, with Gujarati food, he helped me to lose weight. So word of mouth went around. He's not gonna stop your kakras and your doklas and stuff. So I was put onto a flight to Belgium. And every single day meeting, you know, all of these diamond community people, building, understanding health, all of that stuff. So I got into that. I didn't need money for that. Okay, I didn't need money for that. Then I told my wife, like, you know, I know, you know, I'm just going to quit now and stuff like that. She didn't go, damn, we didn't even think about, you know, you're not going to have a fixed salary, this, that, whatever. So I had no backup plan. I had no backup plan. I had Vishal Gondal on one side, okay? <laughs> we were building an idea of Goki and stuff like that. He had said, yeah, come, I can afford 50,000 bucks right now, ESOPs and stuff like that, you know? So I, I just threw myself into it without thinking. A month after that, because I had more time, I don't have a corporate job, my clients increased. And because people needed me more, I started filtering on price. So from 500 bucks, I went to 1,000. From 1,000, I went to 5,000. In three months, I had gone up to about 25,000 bucks because I could filter it out. I knew I was effective, mm. okay? Um, I started building, started traveling, all of that stuff, you know, started saving more, investing more, you know, learned the power of compounding at that point, very late How in life. How old were you? 35. Mm. 35, 36. So everyone says, Luke, imagine if you did this video. Yeah, I can imagine, but now I'm going to imagine what I'm going to do in the next 35 years. So I put a personal goal because a lot of my friends were already doing it from 24. I said in three years, whatever they've compounded and made, I'm going to make that in three years. So then I have no regrets about what I should have done. What's the point? It's gone. I can't go back and change that. But what if I make that amount now and compound that? I'm still ahead of the game. So a little bit of competition is also good, you know? That's your Michael Jordan speaking. Why not? I would do that. And, and I made it, you know? So then uh, Natasha, we had, we had Tiana and stuff. And I, I was very like, you know, I don't want this family model where the parents are working and the child is like, whatever. We had decided no nanny for the kids, no nothing, nothing. And she's chilled out. I said, work with me. I said, work with me, you're a project manager, manage this. I don't understand Excel, I don't want to look at PNL, all of that stuff. She came on board, started streamlining, so I could just go to my coffee shop every day, Taj Mahal Tea Place, and consult and consult from morning to night. She was managing the back end and stuff like that. Six months later, we had to hire a CFO because we had made a million dollars. Wow. Okay, and we didn't even know. She told me, Luke, this is your account. Now we were like, oh, tax and this. I was like, you know, sole proprietor. We had no clue about it, but moving with the flow. So we got a CFO on board because we both didn't understand. This was like suddenly something huge coming into your life. And for me, it was like, no, now what should we do? I'm like, what worked for me is what I should continue doing. Mm. You know, if we could make a million dollars of turnover in like seven to eight months, this only means one thing, you're doing it right. So I told her that I need to continue doing this. I can't get into HR, this, that. Can you build a team? She said, I'll build a team. So I was in Singapore when I hired my first nutritionist. Then I was doing all the clients myself. I was handling about 150 patients on WhatsApp every day with meetings, going to town. I used to go to people's houses, you know, the high profile people. I mean, today it's different. They come to us, but <laughs> you know, I saw so a lot of time expenditure. I was in Singapore, couldn't manage. I called up, interviewed a girl, Sneha on my team, hired her on board. She started helping me out with patients. And we just went with the flow. We didn't have a business strategy. We didn't have a vision. There was one vision. Who comes to us, send them with some value out to their life. Either we reduce their pain, reduce their suffering, or we take care of their problems. Three things. Even today, that's our company vision. Reduce suffering, reduce pain. If we can, put them in remission, heal them. Great, do that together. By just focusing on the first two, you achieve the third in most cases. That's been our company vision. So when the CFO came, okay, what's your five-term plan? I said, I don't have a five-term plan. I have a 24-hour plan. I have 15 patients tomorrow. That's my plan. And honestly, Ranvi, there is no story. When people project me today as an entrepreneur, I'm not. My only, my only skill is what I do with my patients every single day. And since I can't do that now, training the rest of my team. So I'm either consulting or am I the training because I need to make like 30, 40, 50 looks now to handle the kind of pay that we have. So I've never gotten involved with in business and all of these things. I've stuck on my path. I can easily project myself today as an entrepreneur. I did this, I followed this. No, I did what was my gift. I used my gift. Mm. And by using, I'm, in a, I'm a huge believer of this. You know, all of us are given gifts in life. Everyone, all of us. If you don't use it, it'll be taken away from you. 
If you try, you're given a gift, but you try to be greedy and say, I don't want this, I want to take this and try to build this, it's going to be taken away because everyone born is given a talent or some talents, which if we're lucky to find and use it, that is where the abundance comes from. Nothing else. You think people don't have my knowledge? There are people who are way more qualified. In fact, in my entire team, I'm the least qualified. I'm the least qualified in my team because I have registered dietitians, I have all, you know, I have medical doctors, I'm integrative lifestyle medicine. Okay, now, by the way, we built an institute today. We're now recognized by Mumbai University. We're teaching people our skill. So the whole point is, I don't have a story. So when people say, Luke, what's your success? For me, it is just be effective with what gift you have. Yeah. So if I can be effective with a patient today, that's what's building my business every single day. We've not marketed till today. We don't have a marketing plan. We don't do anything. Now I do know, okay, I, I can be smart. My CFO said, Luke, this is great, okay? But what if we do bring in marketing? What if we do bring in structure, strategy? I said, go ahead and do it. Mm. Build it. Yeah. I'm not going to do it. Mm. I don't have an interest in it. I don't have the bandwidth for it. And I don't have the passion to do it. You give me patience, that's my passion. So honestly, again, simplicity. Simplicity. I didn't have to feel that I don't have an MBA. How am I going to take this to the next level? My wife is not an MBA. We both learn a principle. Some months we've lost money. Big deal. We look at the positives. The other months before we made money. Okay, now let's do it differently the next month. And you'll have downs and ups and downs and ups. We're okay with it. So I've not built a five-year plan. Like if you tell me my five-year plan right now is a 1,500 crore company. Ask me why. Because I have about 100 people in my team now who have grown with me. If I get that valuation, I can see myself in the Maldives with them signing out million dollar checks to each of them. And the money I have left over is enough for me to build my hospital, live the rest of my life and stuff like that. That's my mm. five year plan. Mm. If it happens, happens. Doesn't happen, we move on. It's no big deal. Mm. There's nothing to be attached to. My self-worth isn't attached to that. So I've honestly kept it simple. That's the truth of my story. I can make it sound complicated, like I've done this and I've done this and thought strategically. No, the only strategy I have is what, my, what I do with my patients. Mm. Every patient is a strategy because mm. they're different. So that's my story in short, really, to be quite honest. I'm, I've not had struggles. Or if I have, I, I know I'm not holding back anything. I'm an open book. I'm an open book when it comes to things. I made my mistakes, all of that. Yes, overcome certain fears. I was a people pleaser when I started off because who's Luke? Yo, come, 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 I'll treat you free. I want them to like me. So they tell people. But one lady told me that, Luke, don't you have any self-worth? I said, what do you mean? She's saying, you're so good. You don't value yourself to charge for your time? Change in a second. Mm. She also complained three months later. She said, you move from 25,000 to a lakh a month. <laughs> I said, that's it. She's saying, that's the way to do it because you're worth that much. So she taught me a lesson by just asking me that simple question. Don't you value yourself? So I'm not ashamed of what I do today. I have content that has reversed people's thyroid, diabetes free, put people's cancers in remission free. And I have people who want my time, pay for it. It's a model that doesn't make me feel guilty at all. Mm. So that's the path right now. Toughness yeah. and providence, man. Absolutely. And belief. You can't have other people shoot. You know how many people shot down my plan? Oh, Luke, there'll be, uh, there'll be an economic meltdown. You're in a service business. You should have products. What's going to happen and stuff like that. For me, I said, you should do a market research. I said, this is my market research. Look at the amount of McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts opening up all around. I know I'm going to be in business for the next 10 years. <laughs> period. That's my business plan and it's working. <laughs> you know, so... Intelligent intuition. <laughs> because I can't I understand anything more complicated mm -hmm. than that. I get what you're saying. There's a few people I've met in my life mm -hmm. who, when the first time I meet them, I feel a certain wave of, and I'm just trying to articulate this in the best way possible, but I feel a certain wave of freshness. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I also believe that if you are even slightly intuitive or if you're spiritually inclined, mm -hmm. you become extremely perceptive towards what you feel when you meet somebody for the first time. True. They don't have to play a big role or a small role in your life. Just what's that feeling you get? Mm -hmm. And I remember that in my romantic relationships, often the ones where I felt very fiery the first time mm -hmm. I met them, it ended fiery as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And and my deepest friendships, the first time I, I saw someone and I felt calm, that friendship or that relationship. It's boomed. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it blossomed. Wow. I, I felt very calm when I met. Do you remember the first time we ever yes, met? Yes, I did. At Goki? Yes, uh, we met at Goki. But before that, we met at uh, Marine Drive. Remember, we there was some run, a 10K run. And right. that's when Vishal introduced you right, to me right, and right. stuff. Briefly. And then we met at Goki for a longer time. Yeah, yeah. where I spoke to you. Yeah. Uh, I just, I don't know why, man. Like, I didn't know that you're going to help me as much as you did over 
you know the course of knowing you but i just i felt like i felt this weird like freshness which i again feel with some some people and my gauge of that is this is something i'm this is something very personal that i'm saying on the podcast but i'm i'm deeply into the concept of god i'm mm-hmm. deeply into the concept of the universe i don't talk about it often on the internet because mm-hmm. i feel like it can be perceived yeah. with a certain pre uh, preconceived notion oh he's in a god what he's an uncle oh he's he's religious is he right wing is he left wing i don't know uh, and usually this freshness that i feel from certain people i always come to realize that they are the same Mm-hmm. that they have a pre um they have an inclination towards the concept of god and the universe right. uh i want you to talk about that that's something i've never spoken to you about mm-hmm. honestly but yeah. you you spoke about uh, providence right you know yeah. being taken care of mm-hmm. uh do you feel it roots out of that place where you are conscious of that man in the sky just looking after you and throwing down some blessings like yeah. what's what's that like because uh discovering god discovering the universe is a pleasure you only experience once you put your body and your mind through it man mm-hmm. uh what's your opinion on this yes yeah, see i believe in the universe i believe in god now which god that is don't i'm not going to say jesus is the best i'm not going to say i'm not going to talk about our religions i'll talk about mine because this is about me not you yeah. know everyone's free to have their own views yes why give it a name I've been brought up in Christianity. I'm a Catholic, Jesus Christ. I have faith. I'll use his name in prayers, you know, sometimes subconsciously yeah. because maybe that's part of my childhood do, and do stuff. Do you chant in your head subconsciously? Yes, we have our own mantras, we have our own prayers. I say them in the morning, I say them in the evening, sometimes I say them mindlessly, sometimes I say them with depth, you know, but my whole point is I don't want to try to understand it further it's not going to get me anything you see a lot of people today are trying to search deeper into stuff my point is what i've learned is we learn while living life i can't take a break from living life and decide i'm going to go on to this path to search for a deeper meaning because i've seen those people and they finally come back and they're back on that path of life what what if we find our deeper meaning or whether god is real or not while living life everything happens while we're living mm. so is there a god yes absolutely do i believe in prayer absolutely i've seen miracles happen with my patients who pray i've seen someone with a brain tumor a girl in bandra who would never have the money to go through surgeries and when she was given you know what it would cost her at leelavati hospital for the surgery and stuff she just went home calm whatever said i'll just go for sunday mass with faith and whatever and stuff she doesn't have a tumor anymore today mm. now what can we say about that her belief her faith doesn't matter i don't need to know what it is i don't need a study to prove it mm. it works it makes you feel good she has faith it's worked i don't need science now to tell her whether it worked or not or whatever is prayer my whole life has worked around prayer mm. my whole life when i need help i ask for it if it comes to me it's great if it doesn't come to me i know it's for a better reason everything i prayed for you know there was a point in my career i was in that cold call center phase and at that point jet airways was blooming emirates so the the, the biggest thing was like become an air per, you know a flight purser or an air hostess that was like the fanciest life you fly you travel and i lived in chimbai so as you come out of chimbai this saint andrews church I would go there and kneel and pray every day please make me a flight purser please make me a flight purser it never happened I went for interviews jet airways got kicked out because I couldn't speak hindi emirates they said oh, you have to come to dubai for the interview didn't have money for my ticket all of that stuff today when i look back i'm so happy it didn't happen mm. i mean i have nothing against flight purses and all but for me it was never the right thing and i would ask like i'm praying so much why isn't it happening so do i believe in god and mysteries which is the universe when people say there are mysteries in life you know things people are, are scared to discuss that you know they they're easy to say oh prove that god exists mm. or prove that the universe gives back prove all of these things and stuff like prove that, that it I'm doesn't saying, uh, yeah prove that it doesn't is one massive one and look in the mirror explain you explain you from a cell to what you are right now can your science explain that can medical science explain that no can medical science explain the composition of breast milk and how perfect the composition is and how did the body make it no so let's agree there are some things in life which is beyond human intelligence mm. whether that forces from the universe god whatever your choice your choice but absolutely yeah. am i god fearing i wouldn't say i am because there are many things that done where if mm. you were god fearing you wouldn't do it mm. 
But I think I'm pretty practical. I understand like, you know, again, we have 10 commandments, okay, in the Bible, okay? Uh, there are so many people who follow the 10 commandments, okay? And there are so many people who don't, who may break them. You know, there's no data showing us that the people who have broken the 10 commandments are the ones suffering. There are people who are doing everything. Suffering is way beyond just your faith in God. It's beyond just these things. It's unexplained. Like you prayed all your life, why have you gotten sick? Okay, I know a priest who has gotten cancer and he asks me, he's saying, Luke, I've served God my entire life. What do I tell him? Hey, this is part of your plan. What are you going to learn from it? It's part of your plan. Why are you seeing it as a negative? Just because cancer is a negative term. Yeah, maybe you, I wish you didn't have it. You wish you didn't have it. But why don't you consider it in your path like when you preach to us that suffering is a part of life? Mm. Maybe this is your journey that you're going. We have to change perspectives of yeah. how we see it. But yeah, there is a higher force, no yeah. doubt. The universe, where is all this come? Like I'm telling you a story today which doesn't, which goes against everything that leadership teaches you, MBAs teach you, strategy teaches you, and yes, Grace of God, built a successful business, have a great team and all of that stuff without doing anything that the books say that's how success is defined. Where's that come from? My intelligence? No, I've just admitted on your show that I'm, 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 I, was, I was a poor student. I don't have, I don't understand complication. Where's it come from? Mm. A higher force. Mm. Maybe I'm doing something right. Maybe my intentions are good. Maybe I believe in something with faith. And... I'm getting back from the universe. Mm. You know, if I'm going to sit here today and visualize money coming into my account, I tried it all, the secret, all of that stuff. You know, life is trying to show me that, hey, you've already got what you need in terms of, you know what the, what the mechanism is. You're effective with your patient. Abundance comes in 10 times more than what you're doing sitting and saying, I want five crores, I want 10 crores and stuff like that. So you see, again, the secret or whatever, great books. But if you try to go by textbook knowledge again, Everyone right now should have attracted everything, right? Mm. But why not? Everyone's understood the concept. It's alignment. Mm. It's how you take that and align. Most people, and when I ask them, say manifest, if you ask me to explain manifestation in two words, which I know works because we've had, I, I have a multiple sclerosis patient who visualized coming to see me and reset one year later, walking. She was in a wheelchair when she came to previous. She came mm. walking with a walking stick. Mm. <clears throat> Diet plan, all of that, what worked for me? Visualize. I saw myself pressing the lift button, getting in, walking to you, and stuff like that. She's saying that's the thing I visualize every single day. So manifestation is two things. One, no crystal clear what you want. There cannot be no, I want to be rich. What is rich to you? Is it money? Is it a BMW? Is it a yacht? Is it family? Is it love in your relationship? You have to be so crystal clear, and then you got to start feeling like you're already getting it. Mm. So how will, that's it. In the most simple way, visualization, manifestation is crystal clear goal. So when, when I ask people who are struggling in their relationships, what kind of guy do you want? I, I want a hardworking guy. That's not crystal clear. You can get a hardworking guy who beats you up every day. You can get a hardworking guy who's on drugs and alcohol. You have to be so crystal clear about what you want and then start living it like you've got it. Like, how will I feel when I've got this partner? How will I feel when I have a million dollars in my account? But you see, most people are accumulating and not feeling it. That, that, that's when it becomes ingratitude and the cycle breaks. So if you ask me, these things are real. My entire life is built. I told you I never visualized till the age of 34 or 35 when I started seeing the power of this. Today, it's like everything in my life is visualized. Mm. Every single thing in my mm. life is visualized because I have a crystal clear vision of what I want. And the things that I, that I don't get when I reflect, why didn't I get this? I wasn't sure about what I wanted. I just said, oh, I want to be, you know, traveling the world, doing this, this, this. No, I want to be traveling to New York, London, Dubai, Vietnam, crystal clear. And how am I going to be when I land in Vietnam and I have like 100 patients waiting for me? How am I going to be? When I changed that, I started living the dream. Every three months, New York, London, Dubai, Singapore, going towards a wait list of patients. Yeah. Crystal clear. All I did was change. The, I didn't have to change anything. I didn't study more to make that dream happen. I had the skills. I just didn't have clarity of thought. So God, of course I believe. Absolutely. The power of prayer, unbelievable to whoever you're praying to. If you really break down prayer, it cannot work without faith and belief. So today, Ranveer, if you're praying to the universe, you're embracing a tree or whatever it is with faith and belief. Again, it's intention connected with thought, clarity, and the feeling that you are going to get it. That's faith and belief. That could be prayer without even re mentioning religion. 
without anything. We know so many people who chant prayers all the time, mindlessly, but yet they're so worried. They come, look, I, I'm at Sunday Mass every day. I go to the temple five times. I say five, I do five times of prayer during the day and stuff like that and whatever. And they're so stressed and anxious. I say, if you're praying so much, what happened to faith and belief? You're supposed to surrender your problems. How can you pray and you're still trying to micromanage your problems? Anxiety, you're not praying the right way. So don't blame prayer. Blame the process with, you, with, with what, what you're doing it. I know that, that's the whole point. When people say, Luke, you're not stressed. How can I be stressed about something I cannot control? What's, what am I gaining out of it? I have to surrender it. I ask for guidance. I know I'm going to be taken care of. If I can do something, do it. If I can't, I have to surrender it. But trying to control something that you can't is the most, I think it's a drain of energy and it's something that you can never achieve, never ever achieve. So we have to know clarity. I can control this. I can't control this. What I can't control, so can I, am I 100% sure I cannot do anything about it? You can't do anything about it. Surrender. Let me give you an example. A patient. You have a patient who's dying. Okay, there are certain things that you cannot do. But what's the one thing I can do? Get the family together, make the last few hours comfortable for the patient. You know, that's the 1% I can do, but I can still do something about it. I can't change the kidney which is failing hour by hour. No one can change that. But 1%, you can make a difference in that life. So there's always something that can be done. So yes, God, be perturbed. And I don't care what people think. You know, people say, oh, you're Roman Catholic. Oh, but like you said, but you know, Jesus did this, but I, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me. I've not read the full Bible myself. I've taken what means to me and I've made my life story out of it. So I don't care what people think. It's my life, my faith. What I do is working for me. It's working for me. That's my part. Couldn't, couldn't bother me what's, what, what someone's opinion is about it. And some people come, but Luke, you know, this is connected with this. Have you seen this in this religion and that? I said, of course, the Vedas are beautiful. The Quran is also beautiful. But it all comes down to one message, kindness, compassion, faith, belief, service. Can you debate any of that? He said, no, it's the same thing. I said, then for me, that's where it ends. Simplicity. Why are you complicating it? Why do you need to complicate it? You don't need to. It's the same message that every religion is preaching. Now, my question to you is, what are you doing about it? Are you still chasing complication? Or are you starting to practice what every religion is boiling down to? And that's the way I see it. So yeah, I, I don't know if I'm religious. I don't think I am. Spiritual, yes. Do I have faith? Absolutely, yes. Do I, you know, can I say every point in my life today is because of what I have done? I've been guided. You know, there are times I've told my team so many times after I've spoken to a client, I'm like, that wasn't me talking. That was up there. Why should I take credit when I know it wasn't me? I'm being guided what to say to a dying patient or a patient over a year. I've not been trained. No textbooks taught me that. It's a force above that's telling me, does this mean I'm some spiritual guru and I have a gift? No. It's just that I'm open to receiving guidance. I don't think now, like you, we're chasing learning all the time. If we put a cap on it, we stop receiving. When we're open to it, we're receiving. Like, I'll tell you where most people fail in meditation. They're trying too hard. They're trying, close my eyes, stop my thoughts. No, meditation is about close your eyes and receive. Maybe today you won't receive anything in the session. Tomorrow, be open to receiving because power and energy has to be received. <clears throat> you can't chase it. So meditation, most people fail and I can't stop my mind. I'm like, you've not understood meditation. Just sit down. Receive. What are you receiving in those five minutes or yours, 10 minutes? And then take from there and build whatever you have to do. So, you know, these are things which, you know, uh, people see in different perceptions. But now someone would run behind a study and say that unless this is proven, I won't do it. You're lost. You're going to waste a lifetime. And 10 years later in your life, you'll find that, oh, this study was wrong. Now, which is the next study? No, use your intuition. Use your gut instinct. Science can never explain. Even surgeons okay, use their gut instinct in a surgery. If they go by the textbook that if this happens, you do this, no. They think out of the box, they use gut instincts and that's how they save their life. If they have to go by only the textbook, the patient dies. And every surgeon knows that, every pilot knows that. There is gut instinct, which science can't explain. So these are mysteries in life which we should respect, we should never ridicule. If you don't believe in it, fine, you ridicule it, you know, you're only interrupting the energies that are also guiding you, but you're too blinded by your own ego and your pride and the confusion in your mind, which is why, again, meditation is so important for us to see clarity. Like, look at you, you know, look, look at you. You're different from other people. 
Doesn't mean you're better than other people. Doesn't mean I'm better than someone. You're different. Different is great. Different is great. Because you're harnessing energy, the same energy. All, there are four of us in this room right now. The same energy exists. What you are taking and harnessing that energy and making out of it, okay, is what is making who you, you know, you who you are today. Everyone's getting the same energy. Everyone. That's why we always say stress is not bad. Stress is an energy. It's what you make of it. It's what you relate to it. You put five people in a room with a problem, some of them will see it as stress, some of them will see it as challenge, some of people will say, no big deal. The same problem, but the way we perceive it, the way we harness it. There's so a tear coming out of my eye, man. <laughs> yeah, I've cried on the podcast uh, for the it's, first time. It's, it's, that's how it is. And you know, my whole point, Ranveer, the reason I like doing content with you is because it's real. I'm telling you, there are loads of podcasts, no disrespect, but we have finite time. If I'm going to give 45 minutes to listen to a podcast, I want impact. I don't want to learn, hear about stuff that, okay, maybe nice, you know. I love social media. I feel sorry for a lot of so-called fans. And I wish they could change and understand that. Be a fan, but don't idealize some, what are you doing with your extraordinary life? You are going to die. You have finite time. Okay, don't just be this glued in fan on social media, putting everyone on a pedestal. What are you doing with your life? Your life, people don't understand the unlimited potential talent that they have, but they're locking that energy, following one person, trying to be like them, learn, build your life, learn, build your life. So currently, right, I take away from the best doctors, the best nutritionists, the best people, all of that, and I'm building me, I'm building me, but other people are taking and saying, oh shit, let me see what I should do to be better than him. Mm. Let me pull this person down. Wasting a lifetime. There's, there's abundance in the world, but there's an attitude of lack. Everyone feels there's not enough, but there is so much, mm -hmm. so much. So when they change their perspective, they start to change their life right then. I love you, man. <laughs> like, you, you don't know how much. Like, I mean, while I'm grateful for whatever the social media career has given me, this is yeah. what I'm most grateful I'm grateful for. for social media well, but I feel for them. The other day I put up a post, I said, do not be put people on a pedestal, okay? Respect them, honor them, appreciate them. But the moment you put them on a pedestal, you've lowered yourself. Do you feel you need to lower yourself? You don't have to. You don't have to do that at all. In, in our religion, I think all religions against it, <clears throat> they say, Worship me, but it is useless if you are not taking my teachings and putting it out to other people. Don't just come on Sunday mass and touch my toes and kiss me if you are going and treating your brother and your sister and your society badly. You know, don't do that. That's false religion. And that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. So I see that happening on social media. People are all like trying to be. What about you? What about that unique talent that you know, you're blurring yourself away from. And when you find it, people say, look, how did you find your passion? I didn't go searching for it. I found a gap. I felt inclined towards it. It became my passion. It's as simple as that. There's no strategy around finding it. You like something, put it first, give it your all. That's your passion. Someone's passion could be cooking. You love cooking. You have a passion. You have a passion already. You know, so I think simplifying things is what keeps me the happiest because I think the world needs simplicity at this point in every aspect. I do agree when they say that God talks through you. And, and, I, and, I, and I feel... I feel <laughs> I've have to reflect on it, I'll agree, yeah. I'm not a smart guy. I'm being honest. And it's not negative self-talk. It's not negative self-talk. My daughter, Tiana, seven years old, she's smart. Like you said, that generation, intelligent beyond, beyond. Old souls, man. Dif and, and a very different generation. You know, Shilpa Shetty and I were talking the other day because of Vian, her son, Tiana, almost of the same age. And she was like, Luke, this generation is going to be that change we need, that change. And I can see it happen. I can see it happen. They're like so, so intelligent in a different way. And it's a good positive thing to see. That's why we keep the balance. This world has to grow up also with social media and everything. But I think as a society, we need to guide them in the right direction. Be on social media, but that's not you. Okay, put your picture up on social media, but that's not you. The real you is you. Are you happy? Or are you happier when someone gives you likes on Instagram? These are questions that we have to keep asking them because they reflect. They say, yeah, I'm, I'm happy right now. You know, so it's, we have a lot of work at this stage in our life, bro. Mm. You know, to make them think differently. Not preach to them, but make them think differently.
Like with Tiana right now, like everyone says, look, you know, you may be this health nutritionist, but they will go through drugs. They will go that thing. So if they go through it, big deal. I went through it. I came out of it fine. Everyone's tried a joint. My dad said, look, first time you smoke a joint, smoke it with me. I went home, smoked a joint with him, lost the thrill of it. I mean, like, there's no thrill anymore. He took the thrill out of the whole thing. It's no big deal. What's a joint? But everyone who's been banned from a joint behind a thrill, like, oh, I smoked a joint. You know, my first joint, second joint, stuff like that. So I've been, I go up to Tia and I say, come on, let's go out. Let's go to a shop today. Let's buy some cigarettes and smoke. She say, daddy, smoking isn't good for you. And I say, no, come on. It's the cool thing. If you and I want to be cool, let's smoke a cigarette. From the age of five, I've been doing these things with the role plays and models. Now, I'm not saying it's foolproof. Tomorrow she goes and tries a cigarette. I do know she will try it. And I'm okay. I'm happy if she tries, but I know she will not continue the process because it's in her subconscious mind right now. So we can only do the best we can. The best we can. We can't, any, everything we do cannot be foolproof at all and stuff like that. So I'm experimenting with her. She's my daughter. Before I preach to the world, I'm going to make it work the way I want to do it. You know, I'll give you another example with Tiana. Uh, when she was about to turn two, you know, all the parents around were, oh, Luke, be ready for the terrible twos, the tantrum threes. For me, it didn't make sense. I'm like, this can't be normal. And in my mind, that may be your story. It doesn't have to be my daughter's story and stuff like that. Till date, Deanna seven, I remember one tantrum for something stupid. Natasha, maybe about three, four tantrums and stuff. Otherwise, it's been a brilliant part. Now, if we had succumbed our thinking to what everyone said, we're manifesting it. Oh, be ready. Oh, she's throwing a tantrum. But we went in with an energy that this doesn't have to be our child. So when everyone out there saying, oh, the terrible teens will come and all these parents are my child, my child, you're inviting all of that stuff. That doesn't have to be your kid. It doesn't have to be your kid. Why are you inviting that? Why are you manifesting something which is someone else's story in your life? It doesn't have to be that way. Your story can be different. And how many teenagers are there out there who are stable, who have made lives like you and careers? They exist, right? So those people's thinking are their stories which they're trying, they're trying to project on someone else. And if you're not strong enough, you'll become a victim of their projection. But if you're strong enough, like, that's your story. Mine can be different. And so even if my daughter enters a terrible teen, I'll deal with it at that point. But I'm not going to start thinking now of a problem that may never exist, is my point. Simplicity. You know, stay away from anxiety, which is not required. Man, so <laughs> my body's shaking right now. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, man. Like, this is, this is just some magic that you've thrown into this content piece. Like, it's, it's crazy. And, you know, like, just the fact that I get to be a part of this thing with you. Oh, bro, just throwing questions at you, yeah. man. This is the joy of podcasting, honestly. Like that, people don't don't understand on that side of the camera. And I hope that if someone's listening to this in 2031, 41, <laughs> they should know that in 2021, some something happened in this room. <laughs> Which brings me to the last portion of this particular episode. I need I need a break. I need to like find my words. <laughs> but it brings me to the last uh, part of this episode, which is. Questions from our Twitterverse, man. Again, like, <laughs> listeners of this podcast know that I've not entered a zone like that. My voice is shaking. Okay. Um, Tushar Vyas asks, where do you get your tattoo inspiration from? You know, I'd love to know this. Inspiration. Because, okay, I'll tell you. The first time I ever got a tattoo, I got it in a painful part of my existence. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that's the case for you. Yeah. Uh, but it gives me strength every day. I heard The Rock say this about his own tattoos. He mm. said that there's a certain... Uh, cultural trait in uh, Maori culture yeah, and Samoan yeah. culture where they associate tattoos with strength and right. moments of their life and their yeah. own warrior spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how much of that is true and how much of that is truly spiritual but what I do know is that you make your life spiritual or non-spiritual through your experiences and your thoughts true. and there's a lot of positivity I attach to my tattoos so I'd mm -hmm. love to know some of yours like so I grew up in Goa during the hippie time, okay? Yeah. And I was always fascinated with these people, you know, white skin, beautiful artwork, okay? <clears throat> My dad would appreciate paintings, okay? And I would appreciate body art. You know, I was, I, there was this one phase where I would go around and see anyone with a tattoo, which was very rare at that point. Like Indians having tattoos were very rare, foreigners. And I would say, can I please click a picture of yours? Tell me the story behind your tattoo. And everyone had this fabulous story about why, what, some of them pain related, some of them going through dark phases of their life, some of them for strength, some of them were like, you know, I just wanted to be different. 
you know, different stories and stuff. So for me, I was like, when I get a tattoo, it's gonna be, you know, on this arm and that arm and stuff. So I went and told my dad, he said, do what you want when you earn your own money and you're 18 years old. So like I said, early in the podcast, the moment I was 18, I went and got my first, second tattoo. It grew to an addiction. So I said, I'll have my own body art on me because I don't appreciate paintings and stuff like that. I, I can't figure out all of that stuff. But I said, I, I want my own art to be with me, not hanging on a wall. So that got through it. Anything that was good in my life at that point or symbolized something, I did it. So in the yoga phase, I got a little bit of a you know yoga tattoo. In my rave party days, I got a whole psychedelic arm with aliens and stars, abstract on one part and stuff. Zero regrets, absolutely. Not spiritual at all, not to stand out, show off, all of that stuff. It's something personal to me. I used to feel good having that ink and stuff like that on me. It's is, just, is uh, there any inspiration you get from one particular piece? Uh, no, so I have, I have this in Hebrew, which is dreamer. I have this in, you know, only God can judge me. So that's very, very close to my heart. Like none of us can judge anyone. None of us. Only God can judge us. The universe can judge us. So that's something which is very inspirational to me. Also, sometimes when my mind goes into judging someone and stuff like that, like, nope, you can't judge that person. That's God's job. Your job is to do what you need to do. So yeah, that's one inspirational part and stuff. Yeah. Will I do another tattoo right now? I think I'm out of the phase, but it doesn't mean I may not do it. Yeah, I don't same, know. Same. I kept a small part on my back, which is free. And I want Tiana to draw what she wants, <laughs> like whatever, it's crooked and stuff like that. And I want to get that tattooed. So it's mm. like raw art of mm. hers on my body. Mm. So I, I'll probably do that at some point, Beautiful. you know? Just Beautiful. waiting for her skills to get a little bit better, <laughs> a little bit out of whatever now, but yeah. That's Man. Oh, this is a nice one. So Umang Kelani asks, describe the two parts of his life. Okay, Luke, mm -hmm. describe the two parts of your life in one word each before getting into the world of health and after getting into the world of health. I think it would be clueless to clued in. Mm. You think just health does that to you? Yeah, I'm clued into my purpose now, right? Before that, I was clueless. I was happy. Just going with the flow, no complaints. Clueless. But now I'm clued in. I know what my life mission is. I know what my gift is. And I need to utilize it. So yeah, I think it would be clueless to clued in. Okay, in short, Lucky Vignesh at Fit Men's Factory asks, I know you've highlighted this in the podcast. But if you had to highlight some of the initial struggles you faced when you were starting out, mm -hmm. if you had to highlight the difficulties, yeah. what would the difficulties be? Oh, that's a brilliant question. So number one, okay. I didn't have all the fancy certifications that other nutritionists and all have. You know, I had my basic IHM where nutrition is a subject. Of course, it's a proper three-year course, all of that stuff. I had my GCTA. So the first thing people would shoot you down, especially when you were growing, like, oh, you don't have these qualifications. You're not a registered dietitian, all of that. Stuff. So I had to go through that struggle, like go through that. And in my mind is one day I will build my own institute that teaches you my way of thinking. And we've mm. done it today and affiliated. Mm. So that was a struggle for sure. Number two, the second struggle was making the decision of changing from a comfortable 10-year job of fixed money coming in to something where you've never done before. So that was a struggle that lasted for 24 hours. Mm. You know, the other struggles was making a name for yourself because you don't know who you, no one knows you. No one knows you from corporate to the health field and stuff like that. So that was a little bit of a struggle. But uh, I think uh, that was, yeah, the, the third part on a personal front. Uh, so when I got married and we had Tiana a year later, that was the time my career was like, I needed to be in London, Dubai, all of these places. So that, you know, thing is like, your wife's gonna deliver a baby, okay? And this is the time where you can't be there, okay? So that was a little bit of a struggle, but of course I had her support completely. Her mom was down, she said, just go for it and all of that stuff. So these were struggles which I still think about but not really as a struggle, struggle. That's what I can think of right now, mm. yeah. Uh, at Atish22 asks, Luke, what's your way of dealing with toxic and negative people around you? And I have some context here. Mm -hmm. I remember being in this hall, I was hosting an event. Uh, you were <laughs> one of the keynote speakers. You gave like a really powerful keynote speech. That's the first time I kind of had an open mm -hmm. conversation with you also. <clears throat> I don't know if you remember this. And there mm -hmm. was a, panel you were a part of after your keynote speech and you had okay. dominated the room mm -hmm. with that speech. I remember people being wowed. I was wowed. My co-founder Viraj was with me. He was wowed. Okay. That was the first time he ever came across. He said, yo, this guy's got something. Mm -hmm. uh, you were wearing a t-shirt and your track pants. Mm -hmm. And there was a businessman in the same room and same panel as you mm -hmm. uh, who was kind of bringing the whole capitalistic uh, side to the fitness discussion. Mm -hmm. And he began his 
uh talk in that panel mm-hmm. by kind of criticizing you for having tattoos mm-hmm. and you handled it like a gentleman man you 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 handled it like a gentleman on the outside yeah. and i could i could see through you at that point maybe because of all the meditation or just connecting yeah. to another child of god i don't know you didn't even let that shake you on the inside mm-hmm. you he he said something to shake you up do you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah i remember this i, I remember this very clearly you yeah. did you didn't get shaken up yeah you're like yeah cool that's your opinion yeah about and and you know you didn't give him the permission to affect you absolutely because i didn't give away my power right i didn't give away my power only when we give away our power can we be controlled mm. so you have to hold on to these i'm 100% clear of why I have done my tattoos and it doesn't define who I am. It define at the start of my career I used to go to the US to see patients in hospitals and stuff and everyone would be wear your long sleeves people would see a tattoo and stuff like that today I walk in in short pants and whatever to see my patients because they're like look you're real. Mm. We don't want something someone coming with a suit and a tie. So people have perspectives. That works for me. It works for a guy with a suit and a tie. Big deal. Wear your suit and a tie. Don't try to change me. Yeah. You you have you know? like this unshaken concrete sense of yeah. self confidence which i've i've picked up from you that's yeah. what i've learned from you see my job in that room is to share my knowledge it doesn't bother me if someone's bothered about what i wear and there's some disrespecting someone and stuff like that like when i when i go to dubai and i'm with the sheikh he say look come as you are but certain events i need you to wear the arabic traditional for respect of people absolutely fine but other events he's saying be you that's who you are your year not for your dress your year for your knowledge so i'm very clear about that so when i'm on stage or whenever i'm whatever i'm very clear about my intention my intention is to impact people give my message nothing else nothing else bothers me at all so yeah i handle this you know uh it doesn't shake me up that much yeah. it probably would before and stuff like when i was remember I was in the people pleaser phase mm. where like okay i better dress up now and go and stuff like that but after a while people want me for my knowledge not for how i look and stuff like that mm. so yeah yeah i remember this i remember this very very clearly sorry now. i'm bringing you back no, no, i'm i'm happy you brought it up again because i want people to know that you know i mean yes it's nice to dress up all of that stuff i mean you dress up fab you dress up Thanks. really really well it it goes with you my image goes with me and i want everyone to understand that if that's unique to you and you're comfortable it doesn't matter what the world thinks mm. it doesn't matter what the world thinks at all i mean look at look at look at david goggins it is all his interviews the way he is because you want me for my knowledge or do you want me to look good be be specific tell me tomorrow you want me on a podcast that say look i want you to look good okay it's different your intention is not to take my brain i won't even come for a podcast because i'm not going to just dress up and come. so and intention is everything i want i want the younger generation also to realize that uh stop looking for validation are you comfortable when i started off on facebook and stuff where people were like you need an image consultant you need to dress i said i'm my my job is my message my job is done mm. it's it's built a you know multi million dollar industry today mm. you know without me having to change my core and stuff like that so yeah i don't think these things shake me up at all it's a personal decision i don't have a regret now if i have a regret i would be attached to guilt and i would be submissive to that person yes you know i shouldn't you know but that time i was young i would justify you know he's a kid you know teenagers i was a dj so i would justify you don't have to justify anything that you believe in because you're so strongly you know include with what your beliefs are no one can shake them ever no one can ever shake them every oh, single yeah. time i meet you i pick up something different from you and you usually answer the kind of questions that are boiling within my mind maybe okay. in that same <laughs> week or probably the previous day yeah. um i remember this particular incident was the first time i picked up something mm-hmm. from you and i was dealing with a lot of image related issues because okay. i had just gotten into the world of fashion based content i was okay. dating someone who's extremely image driven at that point and that okay. energy rubs off on you mm-hmm. and i saw this happening to you and my first inclination when this was happening was that i got i felt extreme anger towards that businessman who mm-hmm. i look up to now by the way i okay. followed that guy on twitter and i okay. see his thoughts and i realized okay there's more to him yeah. and this was one aspect of his insecurities that he was projecting yeah. on you mm-hmm. i felt anger to him and the way you handled it kind mm-hmm. of just cool me down a bit it made me more self confident just yeah. by observing you in that room mm-hmm. the second time i met you in person uh, which was also the first interview i did with you for mm-hmm. beer biceps right um i picked up so much from you even off camera in that but what i picked up from you the most was your sense of belief and how you said mm-hmm. that you had spoken to billionaires yeah and you asked them what's common 
between, between all of them between all of them and yeah. they said that they all began with a sense of belief and i yeah. think that's the point in my career where i broke my own mm-hmm. perceived limits about my own capabilities i always yeah. thought that no I'm, I, the best case scenario for me is to be a media entrepreneur yeah. you know make a little bit of money here and there but yeah. i won't be able to change the country mm-hmm. with my current capabilities yeah and that just switched something in me when now i really start thinking big i start thinking about changing india yeah absolutely and you can Why not? You're and, already doing yeah. it. See, and, you you've done it. Even if you've done it with one person, mm. okay, that means you have the capability to incite change. Yeah. Okay. Now you're adding a number to it. Okay. It doesn't change the fact. Okay. That you know you can't change. You change one person. Yeah. Now, like like Bruce Lee says, you want to perfect that kick. Okay. Practice that kick one thousand times. Mm. Period. You've got the first kick perfect. Now practice it a thousand times. So you're in- impacting one person at a time. Me, like so, when I say I want to change the world, that world for me is not like every single country. That world is if if you're sitting in front of me right now, that's my world right now. I change you, I change someone else tomorrow, and that's what builds up the entire the mass of the world. But going out and say I'm going to change the whole world, that's like a very like you know uh, loose statement which I will not have faith in. But if a patient in front of me at that point in that thirty minutes they have with me is my world, there's nothing else. That's my world. I changed their life. I've changed the world. Yeah. So I've changed the definition of what the world is to me. So when you say, "Oh, my my daughter is my world," okay, which means, you know, at that point, whether she's sleeping, whatever, she's my world. Mm. It's a, so sometimes we need to take these words and redefine it according to what we are. So yes, can I say I'm changing the world today? Of course, I am changing the world because my definition of the world doesn't have to be what other people think. Yeah. I'm changing it one world at a time. Yeah. You know, there's one of the criticisms that our team receives that mm-hmm. we talk too much about changing India, but that's genuinely yeah. because I believe it begins with a belief. Of course, you have like, to have a belief. Like, and there has yeah. to be that one guy who thinks that big for the other people to say, "Okay, we back you, man." Yeah, but you know, you have to look at it differently. You're you're bang on with your first point. You know, why do people have a problem with that? Because they don't want to change. You know, once uh, I had a, a patient who came to me, okay, to lose weight and diabetes, and said, and said, I know all of this. I know this. I know this. I should do this, 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 this. And he said, okay, please give me a diet plan. I said, you don't need a diet plan. He said, what do I need? I said, you need to just do whatever you said you should be doing. Mm. He's saying, I paid you so much for this. I said, yeah, that's the prescription. You've answered everything the right way. Yeah. You just lack action. How can a diet plan? Okay, substitute action. Yeah. You don't need a diet plan. She's yeah. really angry. Went up on Twitter and all I paid is expensive fees, and he told me action. I went and replied to him. I said, still the prescription is the same. Yeah. You only have to action what you need to do. You know, so we got to call a spade a spade at some point and stuff like that. There are just too many people talking out there, but not applying, mm. not applying. And you know what? A lot, a lot of that comes from low self worth. Yeah, as well. 100%. A lot of it from low self-worth. And you you uh kind of try eclipsing that low self-worth with your sense yeah. of intellect. Oh. Absolutely. Mm. That's why I said extremes. Remember? Mm. People want to move into extremes. They feel important, they feel empowered that oh, I'm vegan. I'm carnivore. <laughs> I'm this, I'm no fat. I'm I respect you. Yeah. Do it quietly. Mm. Do it quietly. You know, I I said this in a tweet and I mean, you can bleep off the word. I said there are people who literally themselves senseless senseless by overeating over consuming porn over dieting over exercising and then they want extremes to solve the problem mm. okay if you over consume porn okay no fat is not your solution okay balance is your solution if you over consume fat diets going to an extreme diet is not your solution achieving balance is your solution these are good things no fat all of that stuff but don't make this your world you've mm. over consumed you not just become some spiritual guru of no fat when you were consuming porn like 8 hours in a day mm. and now you move from one extreme to another <laughs> learn self restraint Mm. Not no fab. Don't go to an extreme. Extremes are easy, mm. but restraint. Like I want to watch porn right now, but I use self restraint and I don't do it. Yeah, yeah. You've made a new neural circuit in your mind by no fab. You've not really developed anything else over time. Yes, you may do it, but show me self restraint and discipline now in the moment. Mm. But you're empowering yourself with an extreme mechanism, which is not sustainable. Mm. Which is not sustainable. The basis of Kama Sutra is balance. Mm. Okay. You're you're not like screwing and making love every single night. The beauty of Kama Sutra is there's a preparation towards that weekend, mm. you know, of 
conversation, gestures, giving a flower, cooking food. That's your build up. That's your foreplay to the main event and stuff like that. I mean, you're shagging every day and all of that stuff and whatever, and then you want to choose an extreme. And then that becomes your self identity. That becomes your identity. So now you feel special. That, oh, wow. But no, you're not showing people that you over consume something before. So your extreme is not a solution. What about people, my happiest people, okay, mm. are not on fat diets. Mm. They're not on fat exercises. They enjoy a shag whenever they want. Mm. They're doing all of these things and they're happy. Mm. So is extremes better than balance mm. is the debatable question. Or is yeah. it as a sense of, you know, identity. Yeah. I'm right there wrong. Yeah, and I'm, I'm like, I'm feeling a part of a group. I can't stand up, I can't stand up alone mm. and say that this is it. I need to hide with a group. Mm. I have to hide with a group and stuff. I, I have nothing against these things. But my point is, you have to look deeper below these things and stuff like that. So I have people, no, fab, look, I'm having nightfalls. What is your body trying to tell you? You have mm. extra semen in your testicles. Go get a good shag or if you have a partner, <laughs> make love. Seriously. Yeah. You know, what's, yeah. listen to your body. These are natural things. Mm. And now over masturbation is your problem. You've abused the system. Mm. I talk about alcohol. The problem is never with alcohol. The problem is with the person behind the alcohol. Mm. If alcohol was bad, everyone should have liver cirrhosis. Everyone should be drunk. But the people who abuse it, use it with the wrong intention. So you don't blame the alcohol, you blame the person. Mm. So extremes, you know, I mean, these things are yeah. messing up society. Every young guy thinks I need to be, okay, let me select my path. Okay, oh, vegans are getting attention. Mm. People doing it for the right reasons, great, I understand. Do it, do it the right way, but don't make it your identity because yeah. your self-worth is so low. That's yeah. my point. Yeah, I feel like even, like, I mean, every young person goes through this where you have to kind of bounce between extremes to then come to equilibrium. I've gone through that Absolutely. as well. Yeah, all of us have. Yeah. But finally, balance. Look, I mean, there's no debate about that. Look at nature. Nature is balance. Mm. It is balance. Even though the one flower, a rose, there can be five roses, they will all look different. Mm. Balance. They can't all look the same. It's mm. the same. We're, we're products of nature mm. at the end of the day. We work in balance of equilibrium. That's why it's called a rhythm. Your heartbeat is a rhythm. Your mm. pulse rate is a rhythm. Your breath is a rhythm. What happens now if the rhythm of your breath changes? The rhythm of your heart changes? The rhythm of your pulse? You move away from, it's called homeostasis when everything's working in rhythm. Mm. Okay, that is nature. The moment one of them change, your body moves into the uh, uh, sympathetic nervous system. Fight and flight, something's wrong. So until Ranveer's heartbeat comes back into normal, which is homeostasis, you know, the body's in stress mode. It mm. is rhythm. Extremes are not rhythm, it's disharmony. Mm. These people in extreme should be calmer people. They should be happier people, but they're mm. more aggressive and angry and stuff like that I, I because the intention is wrong. Yeah. Okay, simple question. Sanket Khandelwal asks, how to maintain consistency in life? That's mm -hmm. a simple but profound question. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful question because like every, like the, the two main ingredients for achievement on anything in life is discipline and consistency. So consistency is like you're already doing it, right? Uh, I believe you're brushing your teeth every morning, right? That's consistency, mm. okay? It's the same thing, something that is important to you. If you're unable to be consistent with something, that means you've not assigned it enough of value. It's not important to you. Don't fool yourself. Mm. Make it important first, then it becomes consistent. Like brushing your teeth is important to you. You don't want your mouth to smell. So you do it consistently. Yes, it's become a habit because when you do something consistently, it becomes a habit. So if your health is really important to you, Okay, so people come, look, I'm not motivated to work out. I said, because it's not important to you. Mm. It's not important. You make it important first. So you can't keep motivating yourself every day. But if you make it important, you'll automatically find. So it's all about assigning values. So whatever it is that you're trying to be consistent with, assign it value. Mm. Assign it value and then start doing it. You'll fail a couple of days, get back on. That's what builds consistency over time. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is slightly kind of a health and maybe brain related question. Mm -hmm. Neetu Singha asks, I have dreams every night when I go to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, I never get a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. And how to solve it? Uh, is there any solution to having dreamless sleep? She's talking about REM sleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so how to increase the amount it of It depends. Sleep? There's nothing wrong with dreams. But if you can remember all of your dreams in the morning, that means you've not gone into deep sleep. And that's why you're possibly feeling tired and fatigued throughout the day. Mm. So what happens is definitely meditation or deep breathing or left nostril breathing before that helps you to move. There are your alpha waves, your beta, your theta, your gamma. So we want to move into these right phases of deep sleep. Mm. And deep sleep is when it's dreamless. Mm. Many of us may not reach that stage and if we reach it, it's probably even for just a few minutes, but that's your deepest sleep. Mm. So if you can remember all of your dreams, you're not sleeping deep enough. Doesn't, 
the dreams are not bad, but what is your environment before you get to bed? Mm. You know, do your deep breathing, your pranayama, cut away from social media because that keeps the thought process going. Mm. You've not yet hit your waves of deep sleep. Yeah. So that's that's a very common thing. It's nothing to worry about, but you want to fall into deeper sleep yeah. using these mechanisms. I'd probably say look into Luke's raw and real. Uh, <laughs> you might you might find some pranayama related uh, pieces. Okay, Samrit Singh Rajput. He's quoted my tweet and says. Are there any tips for students who are in school or colleges? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mental health issues going around. Any advice for mental health for school and college students? Okay, so my first question again, if you do have a genuine mental health problem, okay, fine. But really is your problem a mental health problem? Or is it a norm that society has defined for you that you have made a problem? Like, oh, I can't party for three Saturdays because I have to study. Is that really a problem? Or is it something that you should be sacrificing if you want to achieve something? Mm -hmm. A lot of so-called mental problems are not really problems. It's because it doesn't match with the norms that society has given. So by now, I should be in a psychiatric ward, technically, because I don't go out on the weekends. I don't like chilling with people and friends in a very small circle. So when people say, Luke, but you're this famous person, you don't whatever, you know, yeah, it just because it doesn't fit your norms doesn't make me crazy. <laughs> it doesn't make me seem like I have a mental problem. You mm. know, so first be honest with yourself. Is your problem really a mental problem? If it is, if you need help, take it, however bad it is. Number two, my, my, my most important point is remember right now that you are responsible for solving your problem as well. Take help, coaching, mentors, reach out to people, your parents, communicate, all of that stuff. Being in your own little pit will not solve your problems. <clears throat> but know at the end of the day that only you can solve your problem. Mm. Whether you get onto medication, it's doing only its little job of balancing your serotonin, your dopamine, you know, whatever it is. But finally, you have to decide that I'm bigger than this problem. I'm bigger than this problem. So if they can state a little more in the next podcast, maybe what these problems are, we can face it. Like a lot of people, kids, you know, I, I'm mentally depressed. I don't have a girlfriend. I said, bro, today that's a positive. <laughs> at that age, why do you want to be locked in at 13? You know, go explore your options, learn from everyone. I mean, you'll have an age where you have to be with one girl. Right now, no, 13 is for you to enjoy your life. That's not a mental problem. But because everyone else has a girlfriend, okay, you feel inadequate. You don't have a mental problem. You're just different. Mm. Your time is going to be different mm. for you. So we have to break it down. So if you really have a mental problem, then do whatever I told you. But be honest. Is it really a mental problem? Don't label things because once you label it, it becomes the way you live every single day. Mm. Every single day, it becomes the way you live. So if someone's calling you stupid all the time and you accept it, you begin to feel stupid even though you're the most clever person. So don't use labels if not necessary. If really it's a mental health or a problem, possibly specifying it next time can actually help us throw mm. some more light on it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, final question. This is a team member. Uh, Satyam Pandey asks, what is the meaning of life? See, you know, I've never asked myself that question because I don't know what answer I want out of it. How is it going to change what I do? You know, I think the meaning of my life is going to be defined by what I do every day. Mm. You know, I mean, how how is it going to impact my life right now? Okay, I'm born, I'm here, I have a path, I know what my options are. That's my life, that's the meaning of my life. Right now I have a daughter, there's meaning in my life. I have a job, nurture her, grow her up with the right values, I have patience. That's the meaning in my life. I mean, meaning is what we want to give it. I can have everything and still feel life is unfair because I'm ungrateful. I don't appreciate what I have. It's what we give meaning to it. We give meaning to our own lives and it can be different every day. Today I could have had a great day. Life is great. Tomorrow I go through a down. It's a bad day. It doesn't mean life is bad. It's a bad day. It's not a bad life. Mm. So, you know, it's a question. I don't know how it's going to impact your life by knowing that answer. I think most of us get our most deepest questions answered by living life. Mm. By living life. You know, everyone says, what is love? Okay. I'll tell you today. Okay. I don't know what love is. Because when I love my mother, it's very different from the way I love my wife. Very different from the way I love a friend. Very different from the way I love my daughter. Mm. Okay? So it's an energy. It can never ever be the same for everyone else. Can love change? Absolutely, yes. There's a time when we hate our parents. And then we re-love them again. Okay? Daughter, unconditional love. So if you ask me today that, Luke, will you, uh, what if you had to be in another relationship or whatever, what kind of girl would you want? I would want a girl who I can love the same way that I love my daughter, which is mm. unconditional. Mm. Is it possible? No. They're two different kinds of love. 
So, you know, with these deep questions, I would prefer people, see, this is what happens when you read spiritual books, because they get you into asking these questions and you're like, okay, mm. and you're searching. But is it gonna make a difference to your life finding an answer? Maybe your life meaning will be found by you living your life. Mm. Some people on their deathbeds, because I speak to dying patients all the time, all the time, what's the meaning of my life? I have money in the bank, I have things, but I'm dying today of cancer and stuff like that. So I say, what are the five best things that happen in your life? My kid, my family, my things, I think that was the meaning of your life, period. We don't have to go deeper than that. Why, what are we gonna get out of it? Nothing. So sometimes even the depth that we get into, why are we always going into the deep end? Is it really necessary? Is it being in the deep end always gonna teach us something? Not necessary, not necessary. So this is again what, these are the norms that society hits us with. Someone will start a podcast or something asking you the deepest question so you get the you know attention of everyone. My question is what value is it adding? If I tell you the meaning of your life, okay, is it gonna change your life in one way or another? Absolutely not, but I can tell you what you're doing in your life right now is not gonna lead you to your goal or you can change this to feel better and stuff like that. But meaning, no, these are the mm -hmm. mysteries of life. People who are clued into themselves realize that this is the meaning of my life, to be happy. This is the meaning of my life, to forgive. Mm. I found meaning when I forgived. I found meaning when I got forgiven. Mm. That was meaning in my life. So to, you know, be careful of depth. Yeah. Be yeah. careful of depth. You know, that would be my answer to him. Yeah. I'd like to end this podcast, <clears throat> one, by thanking you. Oh, pleasure. I'm bro. just gonna say a simple thank you to you because, pleasure. man, that's like all my emotions and like all my gratitude wrapped into that one word. And the amount of gratitude I feel towards you as a guy, just for how much you've helped me through the years, without me ever coming to you as a client, you know, just talking to you as a brother, I cannot put it in words, man. And like, just, I, I hope the best for you always. Like, pleasure. Just, I, I wish the best for you as well, everyone you. out there. I mean, I think we should just go on. Sometimes we feel angry with people, you know, all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, just wish well for everyone. Yeah. You know, I mean, whatever. I always tell people, you know, who find it difficult to forgive. I said, what you would wish for the person you love just start wishing that even for your worst enemy. Yes, it's difficult because you got to break through ego, pride, hurt. But I'm saying that is your transformation. Yeah. It'll happen one month, two months, three months. There's no other way. It's just wish well for everyone. Everyone's struggling. Everyone has their own journey. Everyone, you know. So at the end of the day, we should wish well for everyone. I think that's that's the essence of spirituality. Yeah. The end oh, of the day. And... Uh, Man, just looking forward to having you again on the show. We'll, we'll immediately move into a second recording, which is centered around sex and love. <clears throat> so I'm going to end this podcast and I'm going to request my team to start the next podcast immediately. <laughs> Audience, please look out for the next one. This is going to be good.